Alrighty. So what we're doing here is we're going to try something fresh and different. <laughs> so I'm waiting for you guys to show up and then we'll give it a shot and see what happens. Everyone's like, hello, Jamie, how are you? Hi, Debbie. Give you guys up for a second. Reef and Dive, Lamont, Alex, Jay's Crazy Obsessions. Hey, Rick. James, how are you? All right, so we're going to try something different today. I tried the television behind me. <clears throat> I edited a video to put on screen behind me, and then I played it through this camera to see what would happen. And would you believe it? Everything was blue. <laughs> and I was like, oh man, I thought I had this thing figured out. So I've come up with an alternative. So we're going to try the alternative now and we'll see how you like it. So let me do the switch. And here we go. Alrighty, so what you've got here is a view of the top of my tank. I wanted to see how this would play out with you guys. You know, I mean, I had no idea if this was going to work out. And there's actually a truckload of footage here. So this is just things I filmed. So it's going to keep changing <laughs> eventually. And uh, maybe you'll enjoy this a little bit better than the reef tank always looking blurry and washed out and blown out. So I want to try this one. Um, I don't know what your end looks like. I wish I could check it. Um, but I'm sure that the processor is already dealing with me and streaming and playing a video all at once. So we're going to try this out. I'm going to stay in the corner in my little uh, circle here. I think that'll work. And I'm hoping that uh, sound still works properly. It looks like it's working. And if you guys like it, you know, hit a thumbs up so I know. What you're seeing here is I turned off the feed pump for the reef. So now you can kind of look through the surface as it's slowly coming to a, a standstill. But I didn't turn off the vortex, so the ripples will continue to exist. But I'd love to know what you guys are thinking. Lamont, thank you for the super chat. I appreciate that. Let's see. Oh, Than is streaming. Oh, no. I didn't know. Seriously, I've been busy trying to get this set up. So, do you guys like this? <laughs> yeah, I'm a little small now. <laughs> but that's okay, you know what I look like. Okay, so just so you know, this is all pre-recorded. I filmed everything last night. And so there's nothing I can do except play the video. And just so you know, this video is about 48 minutes long, so we can run it two or three times while we talk about things today. And you'll just have a nicer view, and you get to see my reef at the same time, which you usually don't unless you're watching one of my edited videos. So you've just got to kind of watch and see how it goes out. I know it's not everything you're expecting, and uh, you will see some ripples at one point. You will see no ripples. You will see the return pump come on. You will see the tank from the side. You'll see me cleaning the glass forever. There's all kinds of stuff I did last night that I filmed, and I thought, I'll just stick it in there. It's our background. Now, you know, if for some reason I need to take over the screen, I can, but I figure I can pretty much talk to you guys from my little circle, and hopefully, uh, hopefully this comes across well. I mean, later on I'll check the footage and see what it looked like on YouTube, but I'm hoping the quality is pretty decent. I filmed it in 4K, so this is an 18.6 gig file that we're playing into the stream, <laughs> and uh, I don't know. Uh, if it ends up being garbage, you know, We'll try something different, but I want to just try something this week and see if we like it. And of course, your opinions matter, so you'll have to let me know if you enjoyed this, this uh, perspective. And like I said, the perspective is going to keep changing, too. So you're going to see different things. Um, the news uh, that's big right now is an article that was, or a letter that was published by PJAC to a couple of U.S. senators and representatives about the pro proposition to stop all livestock shipments of any kind of animals, any kind of wildlife. 
And so I wanted to read to you guys the letter that is being sent basically to uh, congressional people. Um, and also let you know there's a link which I put in the video's description if you wanted to add your name to the list. They were asking for anyone that's involved in the industry. They didn't actually rule out regular people from being included. There's a couple of hundred people, maybe more, already on the list, including Mila Zarif. And, uh, you know, we do care about um, everyone's safety, but we don't believe that the uh, animals should not be shipped because of COVID-19. So here's the letter. I just want to read it to you. And then you can um, decide for yourself what you think. So the title is An Open Letter on Requested Ban on International Live Wildlife Trade. And PJAC is um, the Pet Industry Joint Advisory Council. And if you're not a member, you can join. So here is their letter. An open letter to Senators Cory A. Booker and Lindsey O. Graham and Representatives Mike Quigley and Michael T. McCall regarding your requested ban on the international trade of live wildlife. We in the responsible pet care community are extremely concerned by the threat to human health posed by the rapidly evolving coronavirus pandemic and applaud many of the steps taken by government at all levels to help control the spread of disease and support economically devastated Americans. However, we urge you to reconsider the sweeping prohibition on international live wildlife trade that you requested in your April 8, 2020 letter to the WHO, OIE, and FAO. This action would provide little defense against future novel uh, widespread infections while doing dramatic damage to American businesses. Like you, we are dedicated to the preventing the spread of zoonotic diseases, but so-called quote-unquote wet markets, where novel human diseases have originated, should not be conflated with a broad legal international wildlife trade. The COVID-19 virus was not spread internationally through wildlife, but instead through human-to-human -human contact. Wildlife has been legally imported into the U.S. for over 50 years without creating a zoonotic incident, and these animals pose no more threat to human health than imported and domesticated animals that are already in the country. According to the 2019-2020 APPA National Pet Owner Survey, 67% of American households, which is 84.9 million, own at least one pet. And the ideal pet for over 19.5 million of those households is a reptile, small mammal, bird, or fish. Many of these wild caught or family, oh, I'm sorry, farm raised internationally. Those that are raised domestically come from breeders who must regularly acquire new animals from unregulated, I'm sorry, from unrelated bloodlines to prevent inbreeding. Halting the legal international trade of these species would eliminate the opportunity to enjoy the physical and emotional benefits of pet ownership, such as lowering stress and blood pressure for millions of Americans. Just one example is aquarium stores. A ban on the importation of wildlife would unnecessarily devastate the aquarium hobby as fish pose zero risk of being infected and carrying COVID-19 and pose little risk of carrying any zoonotic disease. There are very few marine species collected or bred in the U.S., so a ban would end all saltwater aquarium keeping and the thousands of American small businesses that provide equipment, fish, supplies, and maintenance service to services to those hobbyists would be forced to close. Captive breeding of reptiles and arachnids has been highly successful in the United States, but these programs must continually have access to new breeding stock to ensure genetic diversity. Breeders often bring in new animals from responsible, well-regulated overseas breeding facilities. Also, many of the reptiles, small mammals such as ferrets and arachnids bred in the United States are exported to other countries. A ban on wildlife trade would destroy the market for these artisanal breeding operations, which are often small businesses. We ask that you to work with the WHO, OIC, and FAO to ensure that these agencies' response to the COVID-19 pandemic focuses on the true threat from wet markets and does not create unintended consequences for responsible pet owners and businesses. Live animals for the pet trade have moved between countries successfully for decades under a heavily regulated and internationally monitored system that protects both human and animal life. A broad ban on these existing legal trade and the live animals will do little to protect Americans from another novel zoonotic disease outbreak. It will only do great harm to already suffering small businesses and deprive millions of families of the joys of pet ownership. If you have any questions or need additional information, we in the responsible pet care community stand ready to help you develop thoughtful and science-based measures to safeguard both human and animal health and well-being sincerely. And then it's signed by several of the council from PJAC. So that was the letter, and we are hoping that um, 
this will resonate with them and they will understand that stopping the importation or exportation of animals is not going to be some kind of a risk. And uh, so, like I said, the link is in the video's description. If you want to join in and sign, you put in your name and your name of your company. And uh, there's no comments, you know, it's just basically just being added to the list. And I don't know, maybe they're trying to get, uh, you know, 10,000 people to sign this. That's possible. I don't know. But I thought this is a good one. It's an important one because it actually deals with what's going on today. And if no more livestock can come into the country, um, it will definitely affect all those small fish stores that you like shopping at. And we don't want to lose that. And if you're an online shopper, well, the online shopping businesses can't bring it in either. So then you're down to what's left. And this is something we've been talking about for a long time. The whole Noah's Ark situation where if all of the oceans are suffering and we have to rely on only what's in our aquariums and we trade within ourselves, at one point we're going to hit like a, a, a wall of genetic material. We don't have the influx of new genetic material to mix in to keep it diversified and it just, uh, you know, it ends up leading to more and more problems down the road. So we, you know, while we don't take from the oceans in abundance, we do take some. It's introduced. It adds new bacteria to our system and, um, you know, it, it, you know, keeps businesses open so you can keep buying things. So I, I felt like that was an important story to share with you. And uh, like I said, the link is there. That link also is the actual letter I just read. If you want to read it again, in case you just wonder, you didn't, you couldn't absorb it because you're so distracted by my video in the background. <laughs> but that was my uh, my big topic for today, or my big uh, push for today. I felt that was a really important one, and uh, I'd like to just uh, encourage you guys to give it some thought. Uh, Jerry says that the chat is covering my face and to move my head. So I have moved it. We'll see what happens now. Thank you for letting me know. Um, also, it, I guess it depends if you're watching on a computer versus watching on your phone. Because I don't know where the chat is on, you know, when you're doing this. Let me see if I can look at the stream on my phone. Let's see. I just need to see where the chat is. See, for me, the chat is under the video. See? <laughs> you can't see, but it's underneath it. So, um, we'll do that for now. Hey, look, it's me! <laughs> Isn't that creepy? I knew that was gonna happen. I thought it'd be kind of funny. I'm just, I'm talking to you here and then you see me go by cleaning the glass. So that's part of this video. All right, um, let me uh, answer some of your questions and then we'll jump to another topic but I wanted to kind of get your reaction. I want to see what you guys thought. All right, Ed says I should stream in 4K. As far as I know, 1080p is the best we're offered at this time, but hopefully it'll get uh, more high-end as we progress in the coming years. Let's see. And I'm going to try something here. So Andy says, I just found your channel. I'm new to reef keeping, um, and I have, uh, I have had a Fluval Evo 13.5 up for about three or four months. So now it's going well, but I wanted to know if you think I should get a mini reactor for it. If you have room to install any kind of a reactor on your tank to handle polishing the water, uh, running some kind of media, I would definitely recommend it. Um, I realize that smaller tanks, there's very little space in them. And a lot of them are either just going to be almost like a vase, you know. <laughs> you put the water in, the only way to clean is take water out and put new water in. It's basically water changes. And then they have the smaller tanks called all-in-one, where they have a compartment in the back. And even then, people may hang gear off the back, or they try to really find small things to fit into the back area. And that's kind of a challenge. So uh, finding something that works for yours, you might find that since your tank is so small that water changes are really the simplest. But I love the idea of having a separate reactor, like the Fosban reactor I showed in last week's stream. It's a very in, uh, inexpensive device. You hook up a power head to it. You could rig it up next to your tank overnight and let it run carbon, for example, and then the next day disconnect it and put it away. You know, so you just polish the water for a night. Okay, so another thing that I did here that you probably did not catch. Um, 
So this question here that Coral Lovers is asking is going to automatically vanish within 10 seconds. I thought that was kind of cool. <laughs> I've been wanting that forever because a lot of times I forget the words are sitting on the screen. So he asked, what software do I use to develop my website? I'm using Drupal. Uh, that is the uh, operating system. And I have a web developer. And uh, you can do it completely yourself, but I hired someone to do it because they're really good at what they do. And um, when there's a problem, they fix it, <laughs> which is really important to me. So I've been using Drupal for the last few years. I'm literally about to upgrade my website um, in the, I don't know, in the next 30 days or so. And when it happens, it's going to be a completely new look. And hopefully it's even better than what we have now. Um, Marcelo says, have you ever used metronidazole in, re in your reef to treat ick? No, I have not. Uh, Glenn says, I have a large orange record recordia and a smaller yellow recordia. Can I place them together with space or will they be stinging each other? No, you can put them all together. They can, they can all grow toward each other and fill in and it's really convenient and pretty and you can mix up all your colors. So you can have orange and green and blue and, and yellow and uh, just kind of really get this really nice mixture. I really like recordia and I don't do well keeping them alive and I don't know why. Let's see. Mr. Reefbuster said he did test positive for COVID-19. I'm glad you're feeling better, and I'm sorry to hear you got that. So let me talk about that for a second. Uh, I'm not going to talk about the disease. Uh, what I want to talk about is a story that I came across that has... Uh, we need to know more to see if it's going to be a valid concern or if it's just a fear by a group of doctors. And until it becomes official knowledge, you know, where multiple doctors have proven it true, we don't know if this is fact or fiction. So this one group of doctors was dealing with people that have recovered from COVID-19. And the people they were dealing with specifically were divers. And a scuba diver has to wear an air tank on their back and they have to pressurize, you know, as they go down underwater. And, you know, every so many feet... They have to keep re-equalizing their internal pressure. It's, it's very important. Otherwise, your ears hurt and you're, you can get a bad sinus headache and all this stuff. And so scuba divers know exactly how to deal with that. But the one thing that none of us think about is that your lungs are doing a very important job the entire time you're diving. And apparently, this group of doctors believes that after going through COVID-19 and recovering, your lungs can be so badly damaged within your body that you can never dive again. That it literally won't be possible. And that is a terrifying thought. And I was thinking how that would so badly affect the dive community. Let's just say, I don't know. Let's just say 20% of the divers on the planet suddenly can't dive because their lungs were destroyed by COVID-19. You know, we don't know anything. All I, I mean, the general number you always hear is that like 1% of the planet is a scuba diver which is a very small number. But if, a, if that group loses my, my total wild guess of 20%, that can affect the economy greatly for the divers. Plus, you miss out on the opportunity to go down and see the things you love so much, which is our reefs. And so I was reading this story, and I was like, oh my God, is this really true? And see, that's the thing we don't know yet, because we haven't had enough time with it yet. So a lot of people are like, well, I don't want to get it, or, or I got it, but it was no big deal, which, you know, almost no one has said it's no big deal. <laughs> the only people saying it's no big deal are the people that didn't get it. And they're just like, oh, it's just the flu. And I'm like, no, it's way worse than the flu. And I have a few close friends that actually had it and went through it and said it was a nightmare. But there's others that can just carry it and never have it, and then I guess share it with others, which is terrifying too. And if I were just hanging out with someone that's carrying it, and then suddenly I get this thing really badly, and it ruins my lungs and I can never dive again, that would be a real shame, because I waited so long in my life, so late in my life, to start diving. You know, I got certified in 2012, so that's eight years ago, and I've had a nice few dives, but to think, that's it, you know, if you get COVID-19, you won't be diving ever again, is just an awful thought. And like I said, we don't know if it's fact. Uh, we're gonna need more doctors with more divers, to verify the authenticity and, and their research and to find out that's absolutely true. Because apparently what's happening inside your lungs when it gets damaged, it, I read one other article, not related 
Well, it was kind of related to diving. <laughs> it was in a diving group, and uh, it was saying, like, it takes like 20 years for your lungs to recover. I'm like, oh. So, anyway, that's kind of a, a, a unnerving topic. And we'll see, because I don't know fact from fiction, and, uh, you know, it's a, there's a potential risk there that's worth, you know, keeping in mind. So, also, if you did have it, and you are a diver, and you go diving, be super aware. Matter of fact, in the one article I read, it said you should meet with your doctor, and they actually recommend to go to a diving doctor, which I don't even know where to find one. I've never done that before. I have a regular doctor. But they said see a diving doctor who will give you a thorough examination before you go under. And, you know, it's not a bad piece of advice to see if you're going to be okay. And I think it's because when COVID-19 hits you, it lowers the oxygen level in your body. And, uh, you know, a lot of times they put that thing in your finger and it shows like 98%, 99%. It's like your oxygen level in your blood or something. I'm not really sure how it knows that, but it knows it. But apparently it's like 92 or 93 um, when you're dealing with this disease. And, uh, you know, it does stuff to you. It, it starts wrecking things because you're not your normal self. So, anyway, I just wanted to share the potential that this might be true. And I know I'm not trying to cause fear. I'm just saying, you know, be, let's be aware. And uh, hopefully it ends up not being true. That would be my, my guess. Um... Adrian says, I suspect spionid worms are inside the polyps of my acropora. Any advice getting rid of them? They currently are hosting five polyps. Um, you can scrape those off. They're little tiny guys, right? I mean, itty bitty little white curly cues, you can knock those off the coral. That's not a problem. If you have barnacles in the coral, you can just ignore them. They're not going to do anything. There's filter feeders. They don't care about the coral. The coral grows around them, um, and you have nothing to worry about. If it's a vermitid, that's a different thing entirely, and that throws a web on the coral and irritates the skin as it's trying to catch food off of its web. So it, we really need to know what you have for sure, and then you can decide what you want to do. But if it's vermitids, get rid of them. If it's barnacles, love them. Uh, if it's spionids, you can scrape them right off. And you said spionid, and I'm thinking... something slightly close to that name, like Spironid. <laughs> it's a slightly different word, uh, so I might have it mixed up. I apologize. See, ask me things on live camera, you don't know what you're going to get for an answer. Uh, Magroth says, I just got my first clownfish, and they're just swimming in the corner near the substrate. Haven't really eaten anything in two days. Should I worry? Tried food with garlic. Uh, you can try flake food. You can try pellet food. I would try flake food, especially with a brand new fish. And it is normal for them to do something weird, like go in the corner uh, down by the sand, or even up in the corner at the top, you know, in the back. They might go up there. They uh, might seem to snuggle up near a power head. They do all kinds of stuff like that initially until they get comfortable. And then they start going everywhere in the tank, and they find a spot they really like, and they'll stay there for the most part. Um, you said you have one, so I would suggest you get a second one, because it's nice to have pairs. And uh, I would not recommend getting lots of them, just try to get two. And since you've already had one, you just got it, you can probably do anything you want. But normally if you wait a while and you have to add a second clownfish to the tank that's been established for a while, then you would have to find one smaller than the one you have now. So keep that in mind. And don't worry about garlic. You don't need to do that. Let's see. Um, it seems like you guys are liking the video. <laughs> so that's pretty cool. James says, no offense, but your tank is better than your face. <laughs> He's not wrong. <laughs> Jason says, watching Mark talk about watching Mark. Inception. So great. Uh, let's see. James, uh, Kevin James says, Vibrant is amazing. I battled dinoflagellates using all methods for over six months, including yours. And from now on, I just tell people to use Vibrant. No blackouts or any other goofy stuff. Well, that's great. Let's see. Monette made it here for the first time. Welcome to the stream. Okay, so the next question I'm going to have to ask you guys. Um, I don't have the time to, like, edit a 48-minute video every single week. But I'm thinking we can do our streams on any topics, and I'm just going to... I kind of want to just kind of reuse this one over and over. Hopefully you don't mind too much. I mean, you can 
you know, let me know. I mean, I'll change it up some, but I'd like to use this one for two or three weeks. So I'd love to get your feedback if you think that's acceptable or if you just want like, like right now my reef is daylight. It's actually beautiful. And uh, there's no blue in it. Take a picture really quick. And it's my preferred look at the tank. So I'll show you guys what that looks like right now. I'm gonna hit pause so you don't miss any of this. And then we will go to, that's me. How do I get to my, there we go. Oh, it's sideways. Why is it sideways? Well, um, so you can see there's my tank right now with 10K. I could film it in 10K mode and have that run in the background. I could just let it record a long footage of that. So you can kind of see what the tank looks like under what I call sunlight. So if you think that would be kind of a cool option, we can do that as well to kind of change it up. But let me go back, resume last video. And hey, it worked, nice. Hey, and I'm still on here. Hang on, how do I get myself back? <laughs> I broke it. There's that, resume video. All right, here we go. So uh, yeah, that's, Anyway, I was just thinking, you know, I'd like to regurgitate this a little bit. <laughs> you can see I'm still using the cleaning magnet, too. I was chiseling off all the stuff that grew on the glass. <laughs> Furlock says, now I see why you complained about the look of the tank during live streams. It's gorgeous in this video. Yeah, this tank is, uh, it's really pretty, and people only get to see it like this when they come in person, and they're like, wow! And, or if I actually edit a video and upload it to YouTube, not the live stream. The live stream camera just cannot do it justice. Um, Tyler says, what's your turnaround time for acrylic work? I'm interested in a peacemaker for a rimmed 215 gallon tank. A couple of weeks or so, I've been making huge strides, knocking things out. I'm still, I still have probably 15 orders in line. I would say two weeks, maybe three. Um, but, uh, shouldn't be anything more than that. And i will be really glad when I get my oldest orders gone. I, I, I get this immense amount of guilt. I have a customer that right now wants a sump. And he's, you know, he's been, you know, I need it, I need it, I need it. And I finally looked, and I was feeling so bad. And I looked it up to see when he bought it, and I was like, I'm totally within my time frame of what I said it takes to get a sump built. And here I've been stressing that I'm making him wait. And I was wrong. I, I wasn't. I think he was just a little bit impatient. <laughs> That's okay. I understand. You know, when you want your sump, you want it. But I know I said it's six to eight weeks to get a sump completed. And I'm actually within that window. I was like, hey, why am I so worried about this? Uh, Odile says, I heard the other day CO2 tanks will be hard to get soon. Yeah, I heard that too. I haven't verified that. And uh, apparently CO2 gas is going to be hard to come by. I don't know who's consuming it all, but uh, eh, apparently it's a thing. So that's a, uh, you know, if you haven't filled up your CO2 bottle, maybe you should. And if it's not empty, maybe you can get it topped off or maybe they have to drain it and fill it again just to be full. I just literally shared with you guys not too long ago, and there's a blog on my website, a huge 20 pound uh, CO2 tank I got, which in theory will probably last me a year and a half. So I don't really have to worry about CO2 for a while. And I, like I told you guys in that stream how to, to check to make sure it's not leaking so you don't waste the gas. So I'm hoping you do that as well if you are running a CO2 tank. Uh, Jamie says, I just got no pox. It says not to run phosphate removal or nitrate removers. That's right, because it is the nitrate and phosphate remover. But it doesn't say anything about running carbon. Is it safe? Yes, you can definitely run carbon in a reactor or in a filter sock, and you can just put it down, you know, you know preferably in the sump where it's out of sight, and let it polish the water and absorb things. Uh, Hunter says, is a small 20-gallon sump with skimmer better than none for a 40-gallon bow front? A lack of space issues. Yeah, yeah, there's very little room under those tanks. And you know, that's better than nothing, yes. You can put your heater down there. You can put your skimmer down there. You can have a return pump down there. Uh, I don't know what kind of budget you're going with, you know, what you want to use. You could go cheap with something like a mag pump to push the water back up or uh, you know, some Chinese brand. Um, or you could use a um, uh the Vectra S1, which is, or S2, which is a little tiny pump. It's adorable, and it's very controllable. And uh, it can be plugged into a battery backup to keep it going if the power goes out. But uh, yeah, I love a sump under a tank. Anytime you can put a sump under a tank, it's a good decision. And I know it's small, and you can have your top off down there to replace water as it evaporates. Uh, 
Um, if you don't have room for the top off container, because like you said, limited space under the tank, you can always have it next to the stand in view and hide it under a basket or something, or, or get a small cabinet from Ikea to hide it in, and you can run the tubing through the wood to the sump, and that way you'd have top off and you have a little cabinet to hold the jug of water, and that way you're not having to pour in water yourself manually. Uh, Dave says, I'm going to have to upgrade tanks. How long can I have my Trident offline? How long does the reagent last? Okay, so reagents are good for up to a year, brand new, unopened. Once you open them, they're kind of, you know, they're already counting down. And putting a lid on them doesn't mean they're going to be good when you finally get around to setting up. So you might just have to toss them. That's what most of us are doing. Um, if your Trident is going to be offline for more than 72 hours, it is recommended that you go ahead and put it in shutdown mode and completely have it drain, purge all the lines so it's empty, and then you take it away from the system and you put it away in the original box until you're ready to use it again. And then you would set it up anew, and whatever the reverse of that is to get it going again. I haven't had to do that yet, so uh, I can't answer that question yet, but that's what you do. And if for some reason you don't have reagents, like some of you might have a Trident and have a really hard time getting reagents, saltwateraquarium.com as well as BRS have had some reagents and have been sending it out. And, uh, you know, they've been trickling it out. You know, like every day there's a little bit. So you have to keep checking back and checking back. And it's a little bit of homework. But uh, if you absolutely can't get any and you're at the point now where the machine can't run, put it in a shutdown mode and just turn it off and go back to living your life the way you did before you had a Trident until you can get that resolved again. Uh, Ronald says, I bought the reactor from last week's live stream. Thanks for everything. You don't know it, but you set up my Red Sea 425. You mean those little tips I give you helped you with your tank? That's awesome. Oh, I really like this spot of my tank, and it's in the back. And you have to look at it from behind, and you have to look at it under blue lighting. And that chalice right there next to that Montipora with the uh, shadow caster above it and Drew's acro in the background and the Milka on the right, so pretty. And that orange thing right there dead center now is the uh, Sunset Montipora. And then there's some green uh, Pasillapora, I think is what I got from Dwayne. And there's some blue tort to the far right now. So that's a really pretty section of my reef that barely gets seen unless I take a picture. <clears throat> Um, Reefing Dan says, hello from the UK. What algae can grow without light? <laughs> I've seen some red stringy algae in my sump, which has no light. What you may be seeing is cyanobacteria. We grow algae with light. Algae needs light. It's, that's how it grows. So I don't have any idea what algae you could grow that doesn't need light. I don't know why you would want to do that in the first place. Uh, Walid Reef says, how to balance the nutrients import and export to avoid any type of algae? You know what? You don't have to fear algae. Algae is just part of a reef tank. And if you have a good, healthy cleanup crew and you've got your nutrients at a lower level, you don't have to worry about it. I mean, you're looking at my reef right now. You're looking at it literally in 4K mode and you're not seeing algae. And you saw me clean the glass and the glass wasn't covered in algae. It was more like a uh, some stubborn stuff that a cleaning magnet couldn't remove, so I actually used a razor blade and trimmed off every square inch of that glass because I hadn't touched the glass in two weeks, and so I had to do it because it was starting to look like I was looking through a screen at my reef. But algae grows where there's a lack of mouths and where there's a lot of nutrients and where there's a lot of light. So if you get everything balanced incorrectly, you're not going to have to deal with it. Some people, um, I would think a lot of people starting up new tanks, Actually, I would say almost everyone starting a brand new tank with dry rock and dry sand are going to encounter all kinds of nuisance allergies in the first few months because of the nature of setting up a tank like that that's so uh, pristine or uh, so so dry. <laughs> you know, there's just no life in it. And, uh, you know, I've mentioned this in other streams. You know, I love live rock instead of dry rock. And you can still buy lab rock these days. It does exist. And I understand saving money. So I understand like using dry rock for base rock and putting live rock on top and letting it migrate the life into the rest of the rock. That's one method. But even brand new dry rock really needs to be put in a barrel of salt water and uh, left simmering for weeks on end to export the phosphate that just comes out of that new rock. 
and you can check if there's phosphate with a test kit. <laughs> and you've got salt water running and you just take a sample out and you measure and you'll see what your phosphate levels are. And odds are it's not gonna be zero. So that would be part of why you're starting to get some algae in the tank. It's because phosphates are coming right out of the rock. And by cooking the rock in a barrel of salt water, that whole simmering thing I was talking about, you can do some water changes and kind of reduce the phosphate in the first place. And that way when you move the rock into the tank, you're kind of ahead of the game a little bit. But even then, <clears throat> as the tank is getting established, you still have the uh, issue of the ugly phase that happens to everyone. And there's a few months where the tank just isn't pretty and it goes through this algae and that algae and the diatom bloom and then you've got some hair algae and you know, you add a cleanup crew, you're running the lights too long, you're running the lights too bright, you know. <laughs> you didn't even have corals in there and you had the lights on 10 hours a day for no reason whatsoever. And so it grew algae. And that's when you need a cleanup crew that can work on the tank. All right, let's go to the next question. Um, this is a weird one. Kevin says, my newly introduced six-line wrasse has been eating my bird's nest frag and doing severe damage. That is weird. Um, I don't know why a six-line wrasse would be interested in any coral. They usually are more kind of aggressive toward fish. Not really sure what's so special about that bird's nest. And it really depends on how much coral you have. You know, if you've got 10 cute little adorable one-inch frags, then every last one of them matters. If you've got colonies and you have some fish nipping at this and that, you can decide does the fish need to go or not. But I'll tell you, six-line wrasses are kind of aggressive. And that's why I recommend the four-line or the eight-line wrasse because they're more docile. <clears throat> uh, Steve says, have you ever seen a white fuzz, a white algae growing on coral or on the rock or on the glass? I'm trying to help out a friend, doesn't know what it is. It's possible that the fuzz is a, uh, I mean, there's a couple different things it could be. Uh, it's possible it could be a bacterial thing. That sometimes happens. Um, it might be in the algae family, but probably not. It should be something that you can remove. Um, and, you know, my normal approach would be to scrape it off. And, uh, again, you're, you're needing cleanup crews. That's the important thing with every tank. The cleanup crew is so important because they are nibbling on everything and cutting stuff off. But you may see a spot in the tank where this fuzz is, but nowhere else, too. So is it even worth worrying about? Because it's contained. It's in a little area. It's not spreading. It's not getting worse. It's just kind of this weird thing in a cryptic zone. Just leave it alone. Let bugs live in it. Uh, it really comes up to you. Okay, so this little clip right here, um, <clears throat> I want to talk about the surface of the water because I've got the two um, RFGs that are pushing water straight across the top of my reef, and I just love the way the water's moving across, and that's something that's so important with our reef tanks. We have a lot of flow, and I thought this was a really good demonstration. It kind of makes me think of what the view is when you're looking out your window when you're driving on the freeway. It's like shoo, going right past you, and... Uh, I, th I just thought it was kind of a cool thing to film, so I wanted to show that to you guys. Uh, Dog Miner says, is it possibility of a reef tank without an ATO for a short time manually topping off? Yes, you can definitely run a reef tank without a top-off system. It's just the top-off system makes your life so much easier. So if you can just manually top off once or twice a day, you can do that indefinitely until you're finally ready to automate that. And then, you know, once you automate it, you're like, oh, this is so great. I'm so happy. And I, I highly recommend it. Uh, topping off the tank automatically is like my number one first thing to do on a tank. And then the second thing is a waste collector for the protein skimmer that will turn off the skimmer when the skimmer's full. I just, I love those two tools. They made my life immensely better. And both of them were like, I should have done this so much sooner. Uh, Steve Smith says, I'm moving from a 65-gallon to a 100-gallon tank. Uh, you know what? I need to move these over a little bit. There we go. Uh, mostly softies and LPS and a few encrusting SPS coral frags. Is there a limit how many I can move over at a time? You can move them all. That's not a problem. You can just work your way through the entire system and transfer everything over. What you want to do is make sure both tanks have the same everything. Same temperature, same uh, alkalinity, same you know magnesium, same calcium, same salinity. And if all those match, 
you can just start moving corals over one after another. And uh, if you want, while you're moving something, if you see something you don't like, you can trim it off with some cutters and put the cleaned up item in the new tank so you don't kind of transfer the problem over into the new tank. But no, you can do it all at once. <laughs> uh, the ranch says, are vermited snails, you know, vermited snails, are they the cause, oh man, how do I word this? Will they cause the scullage to close up and show their skeleton and not be as puffy? The vermited snails cast this web and the web just sticks. Think of Spider-Man. He shoots his web out and goes onto a building or whatever, right? The building's not alive. But when this worm throws its web onto a nearby coral with soft tissue, the coral feels it and it retracts. And it's being irritated by that. And every time this worm throws the web, it irritates the coral more and more and it will retract its skin or it, it could just deteriorate. It's one of the reasons why we do not want vermitids in our tank and we do remove them. So the best thing you can do is break off the tube in the first place. The second thing you can do is glue the hole shut where, the, where you can see the hole where the tube came off and just seal the worm inside the rock work. If you don't want to do that or if that's not good enough for you, you can take a dental tool, some kind of a, a pick, and put it in the hole and break it up, you know, grind it and pull the actual shell right off the rock with the worm and get it out of the system. Thanks, Andrea. <laughs> She's answering something I, asked, I talked about 20 minutes ago. A Marine Reefs asked me, have you seen the, the new Glamorca RO five-stage system? I have not, but I sell RODI systems. <laughs> Is it great? Do you love it? Are you buying it? Um, well, Lead Reef asked me a question in centimeters. How on earth am I supposed to answer that? I don't know centimeters. I know inches. Um, let me do some math here. So 48 inches by 69. Okay, this might be like a five foot tank. So he was saying, how many MP40s do I need for a tank that's 48 by 24 by 24? I would say two, one at each end. And you can have one lower and one up higher. And that way the, the flow will be coming in at different levels in the tank. So that would be my recommendation. And if you get the MP40s, I highly recommend that you get the uh, battery backup to keep the pumps running if there's a power outage. Because if the power goes out, at least the flow in the tank is still happening like you see in this video. It's very, very important to keep that going. Let's see. I'm glad you guys are liking this video. Yeah, that's a great idea. So here's what Ed suggested. Repeat is good. Maybe record and release a new background video each month. So that way we've got, you know, one for four weeks. And then the next month you get a new thing to look at. Because, you know, odds are you won't be re-watching a stream. So that way, you know, as the conversation happens, you still have something nice to look at instead of that blown out, washed out reef that just bugs me to no end when I talk to you guys normally. I always see it and I'm like, ugh. All right. Dash Dash, because I don't know what else to call him, <laughs> says, looking for good amino acids. Any suggestions? Uh, Acro Power is one made by Two Little Fishies, and that's very popular. A lot of people like it. Uh, there's a lot of different brands out there with uh, amino acids in them. And you can look, Brightwell has it. Um, I'm sure that uh, Continuum has them. I mean, there's so many brands. But... I, I don't know which one is a superior one over another one that's lesser. I've never really heard a negative. Hey, there's my hand. I was feeding the fish in this part of the video. I'd been so busy filming, I didn't have time to thaw food, and I was throwing in pellet food, and I was throwing in um, this really fine powdered food that I got that's really designed for fish fry. And I was like, ah, I'll just feed that to the tank, just get in the water really quick. And so as you're looking at this video, I don't know if you'll be able to see it, but you'll see pellets floating on the surface. And uh, that's just temporarily while I was doing that. 
Uh, John says, any issues finding plexiglass lately? No, my suppliers have been uh, able to supply me with what I need, and I've got quite the stash. Um, Walid says, how long does Aptasia require to show up during a quarantine of corals? You'll see it pretty quick. <laughs> uh, I would say you might see Aptasia on a coral that you just got. It's still in the bag, wide open. So, you know, it's not like you're going to have that coral in there for weeks and finally you see the Aptasia. If it's there, it's there and it's going to be visible because it wants to capture food out of the water. It's going to open up and be waiting to capture any, any kind of crumbs. So just inspect your coral, look at it under different light, look under white light, look under blue light, you know, just kind of check. I mean, white light's always best, but certain things will show up under blue light. And you're like, oh, what's this thing? That's weird. And you can scrape that off the frag as well before you put it in your tank and that way you don't risk putting in something you didn't want. Uh, Justin says, can you grow coral just with a reef bright blue actinic light or do I need another main source of light? I am going to tell you you need another main source of light. I am sure there's some people out there that have managed to grow some coral under just actinic lighting, but I don't recommend it. Um, it looks really pretty. It's great. I mean, this, this video right here was shot with only actinic lighting, but right now my reef is getting a bath of metal halide lighting that's daylight. And that was the picture I showed just before, you know, 20 minutes ago. And it gets that for several hours every day, and then it switches into the blue, which is the pretty uh, phase. And then it goes to this point that you're looking in the video um, every night for the last hour, hour and a half. I had to extend it because I was so bad about feeding my fish on time. I had to run the lights longer. I actually have a button that I've had to use this week. So my anemone cube, which that'll be a different video. I'll do a video of the anemone cube to put in the background. You guys will like that. So that'll be coming. But... Um, the anemone cube has a radion that follows the lunar schedule, and when it's a new moon, the tank goes dark early. So I'm like melting food to feed my reef, and I, I'm like, oh, the anemone cube is dark. And I've found they really want to be fed while the lights are still on. <laughs> and by that, the reason I say it like that is because I have a button I can push on my apex. I just hold the button for a couple of seconds, and it turns on the reef bright XHOs on the anemone cube, and boom, the tank's full of blue light. And all the fish shoop, go into the anemones. And they're like, I'm putting in food, and they're like, we don't care. What is that bright light suddenly? That is weird. It came out of nowhere. So I really put a lot of uh, concern into my fish's feelings, which they probably don't have you know, in real life. But I just assume they don't want to be bothered. They don't want to be uh, shocked or scared, and I try to leave their schedule alone. I don't like to abruptly hit a button and make lights come on so someone can see my tank, for example. If they come at the wrong time of day, I'm like, I'm sorry, you came at a bad time. And late at night, if I'm going around the house, I try not to use any lights that will bother the tank as their fish and corals are, are resting or sleeping. So, I, I, like I said, I'm probably over the top on that, and I'm sure they'd probably do just fine if I flipped on lights, but I just don't do it. I don't want to bother them. And uh, so last night I hit the button and all the clowns went right in and I put in the food and they were just like, we don't care. And I was like, it's blowing everywhere. Now's your chance. Eat some food. And I came back, you know, two minutes later and put a little bit more in and a few heads came out, but they were not happy. So I made this awesome button to make my life easier in case I couldn't, you know, get to the tank in time. But I have to literally hit the button before the deadline, you know, before the tank has already gone dark. Once it's gone dark, I might as well just say, forget it. I'll feed you tomorrow because I missed the window. And so that's what I was saying before. I've actually extended my lighting period a little bit later because I kept missing the time to feed them. I would look at the clock, I'm busy doing stuff. I'm like, oh my God, it's 10.30. I'm supposed to feed the fish right the second. And I rush in the kitchen, I start melting some fish food. If I would just melt it at like 9.30, I'd have it ready at 9.45. I could feed them way before the lights shut off. But the radion is on that new moon lunar schedule. It goes dark earlier than 10.30. And then when it's full moon, that tank will be lit till one in the morning. <laughs> I wanted to hurry up and switch this to show you guys the air coming into the tank when the pump turns back on. So I thought that was kind of a cool video. Uh, Marine Reef says, what do you use to clean your glass and the best product not to scratch it? So I have always liked the Algae Float Cleaning Magnet. It's great for day-to-day -day cleaning. And if you just stay on top of it, your glass really shouldn't become a big problem. And then once a month, I like to go over it with a certain type of razor blade <clears throat> called a handy blade. And it fits in the easy blade, which is glued onto a mag float. And I always use a brand new blade. I never use the same blade twice. 
and I used it in my entire reef. I cut, you know, in the earlier part of this video, you saw me just working my way across the glass. And it was a little harder to do it under the blue lighting, you know, because I couldn't really see as much as I normally can if I were to do it during the daytime. But I was thinking, eh, that'd be kind of cool to show me working on the tank in the video. So I just kind of chiseled away at it and worked my way around all three sides of the tank. And then this morning, I went ahead and did the anemone cube, and it looks perfect too. But if you're using a regular cleaning magnet regularly, like daily, it shouldn't get out of control, and then you might only have to hit those corners with some real extra TLC once a month. And, you know, that would be nice. I did uh, use the flipper cleaning magnet, which has a scraper on it. And unfortunately, it did scratch my glass, and I'm very picky about my glass, and so I don't use that on my tank. But I have used it in other areas of my tank, which was very convenient, and uh, so I don't, you know, I, I actually sell it because I do use it, but I just don't use it on my glass. Uh, that's my top-off container. It holds about 43 gallons of water. And there's the algae turf scrubber in the background, which is full of algae. Uh, I say full. It's very close. Um, I'm looking forward to it looking like this crazy Santa Claus beard of green green hair algae. Uh, right now it's kind of getting thick, but it's not quite there. Um, so I'll be sharing pictures of that or videos soon, um, probably via Instagram and Facebook. Um, Callie says... I'm currently using ESV calcium and alkalinity. Oh, sorry. I know that video is making music. <laughs> um, so it said, let me switch this for a second here. I'm currently using ESV calcium and alkalinity. I plan to switch to the bulk powder. Being that the new one is soda ash versus bicarbonate, what do I need to watch for? Um, okay, so this is the one where I always mix it up, and so I don't want to tell you wrong. But if you're normally using the ESV liquid, they actually sell a carbonate and they sell a bicarbonate. There's two kinds. And if you're using that kind and you're switching to a powder form of the same thing, there's not going to be a change. But, uh, and like I said, this is the one I always mix up. I literally, every time I have to talk about this, I go look it up. But since we're live on camera, I'm just going to say I can't remember the stuff and I'm probably going to mess it up. But one will raise your alkalinity and not affect pH. And the other one will affect alkalinity and pH at the same time. So you want to make sure you're using the correct one for your tank. But switching from one type of two-part to another type of two-part shouldn't be a big, sudden, drastic, fearful change. The change should be pretty smooth. It's just going to be really important you stay on top of water testing. Maybe test twice a week instead of once a week as you're making the transition to make sure that you're not putting too much into the tank because let's just say product one has... X amount of strength and product two has a higher amount of strength, you could actually be double, you know, overdosing accidentally, even though it was the same amount of solution going in because they're not the same chemical makeup. So you want to make sure that's correct. So anyway, I would stay on top of testing. You could test every other day. You could test every day if you want. I know one friend, he tests every single day with his tank and uh, I think he's a little bit crazy, but it's still, a, it's still a good thing to do. And I do want to remind you guys, you know, we're only an hour into the stream but I do want to remind you, it is water test Saturday. You are supposed to test your water today. And when you've tested, you can go ahead and run your, uh, you, you can put all your results together on a piece of paper or in an app like Reef Trace, and you can share it to Instagram or Facebook so we can see your numbers and we can discuss. If you have questions, you know, we would love to, uh, you know, be able to help you. So we have created a group, which I've mentioned many times. And it's funny, a lot of people listen to the stream. And I've talked about this in every single stream that Club Mila's Reef exists on Facebook. And someone will say, yeah, I heard it on the stream. I've been following you for two years. <laughs> Thinking, and you're just now coming to Club Mila's Reef? You could have been here two years ago. Well, not really. Uh, the, the club's been around for about a year and a half. We have 7,500 members. Um, I personally approve each person that gets added. Um, we ask three questions um, to get into the group. You need to answer the questions. And... Uh, other than that, it's it's a really good group because we're not berating people or putting them down. We remove anyone that wants to be that kind of person because I want a nice, friendly community where we can help each other and answer questions and laugh and joke, but uh, not put people down. So I want to just let you know that's what the group is about. And if you're looking for anger and contention and hatred, that's every other group. <laughs> you can go enjoy all of those. But our group is friendly and nice, and uh, and it's so far so good. You know, I have a video in there, in that group, that's the instructions or the rules of how to be in that group. And uh, I definitely recommend that you watch the rules video if you haven't seen it yet. 
and it will help you to understand how I came up with this crazy idea. And I mentioned in the end of that video, if this thing doesn't work out, I will close the group. I'm not going to create another thing on this planet that is full of contention and anger and, and put-downs. And uh, you know, I want people to feel like they can ask a question, like you guys do here on the stream. Some of you will say, hey, this is a dumb question, or I'm sorry to ask this again. It's like, that's okay. We all have questions. I have questions too. And I, I go ask people, and I hope they won't make fun of me also, you know. And uh, so that's the point. And we have a bunch of moderators. And if there's any kind of problem, you can just let us know, and we'll look into it. And if it's, you know, maybe it's just the way you read it. It wasn't as bad as you thought because, you know, we're impartial. We look at it and we're like, eh, no big deal. Or we look and say, oh, no, that's got to go. And we just take care of it. So we're, we're there to keep the peace and make sure it's friendly and, and useful. And I love it because you can show pictures of your tank. You can show us your livestock. People show us their crazy DIY ideas they came up with. Um, they show us their electrical panel, how their wire management, you know, the way their lights move. I mean, they have all these things they do. It's really cool. So I definitely recommend that you join if you haven't and uh, be a part of the group. All right, let's restart the video. Enough of this, right? And I'll turn this other thing off. All right, the intro music is gone. <laughs> I do want to mention at this point, uh, anything you buy from my shop does help pay my bills. And I have been working nonstop. Uh, the virus has not affected my work at all. I work alone, so I haven't been worried about getting infected by anyone. And I box things up and I drop them off at FedEx or at the post office almost every single day. So I'm constantly filling orders as quickly as I can. If it's something on the shelf, I just sell it to you. If it's something I have to build, it might take a little bit longer. It just depends on what's going on. I try to pre-build things whenever I can, but there's a lot of things that are custom. And it needs to be a half an inch wider, or it needs to be, uh, you know, the base needs to extend a little bit further, or you know, I need to be skinnier. You know, these things happen, and I understand it. So uh, if there's something you're interested in getting, I'm happy to sell it to you. Uh, if it's something that needs to be custom made, I need you to give me some dimensions. We may have some emails back and forth to figure it out. If you've emailed me and I haven't replied to you, email me again. There's a lot of you and there's one of me. But uh, And finally, the shipping on my website is always for FedEx Ground, and sometimes you order things that are itty bitty, very light, very inexpensive, and you see the shipping, you're like, ah, oh, how can it be that much? Well, odds are it's not going to be that much, and I will refund you the difference when I ship out your order. So you're not going to get hammered with shipping, you know, unless it's something big and heavy, and then, you know, it's going to be what it is. But I always try to save you guys money whenever I can, and I send out refunds every single day, too, for, you know, seven bucks, eight bucks, nine bucks, you know, it depends on who's buying something. I have one repeat customer. He keeps buying from my, uh, hey, there's some Nori. <laughs> uh, he, uh, keeps buying things to ship to Alaska and then shipping is, you know, like $41 with FedEx and I can ship it for $12 with the post office and I send him back a whole bunch of money because, you know, we just want to get him the product. I'm not trying to make money off of the shipping. So I would never do that. There's a blasto. I can see one little polyp inside the Milka. All right. So enough of that. Let me go back to your questions. Um, Manny says, my nitrates are high, my phosphates are 0 .003, which is incredibly low. Would you recommend a biopelt reactor to lower them? If not, what else? Already using no-pox with no change, also use Prodivio. Okay, so you've thrown everything in the tank at once. No, don't add biopellets. Don't add one more thing. Um, your phosphates are a little too low. You need to come up a fraction higher. 0 .03 is what we want, but you have 0 .003. That's three... I don't know what number that. <laughs> Billionth? I don't know. God, I'm so bad at math on camera. I hate myself. Um, it's supposed to be 0 .03. So you're super, super low. You can raise it up a little bit. Now, to get nitrates down, the simplest cure is a ginormous water change. And if you can do a 50% water change on your tank, it will cut the nitrate in half in one water change. Your water change water has to be the same, though. It has to be the same temperature, same salinity, and the same alkalinity, slash pH. You know, those, if those three match, then you're, you can do a huge water change without affecting anything, and you'll be taking out all the nitrate, because the nitrate's in the water. So you can do that to reduce it really, really quickly. And if you were trying to, um, like, let's say your nitrates are 80, and you do a 50% water change on the tank, then as soon as you're done, you know, you can check your tank later, and it'll be about 40 and then in two days, you do another 50% water change, they'll be at 20. And then another two days, you do another 50% water change, and they're at 10. And now they're down nice and low. So you can do it that way. 
Uh, in my system, I would have to do a 225 gallon water change to cut my nitrate in half, which is why I'm trying other things such as no pox, such as the export brick, and now I'm using this turf scrubber to see what happens. And uh, a lot of people have been saying, but you have a refugium. And the refugium's alive. It's in this video. And uh, the plants are still growing. They haven't died off. So we're, I'm not sure how that's going to work out. I've had a few people say your refugium may not survive. And it's possible. So we'll see. But in the meantime, for now, the plants are still growing and the turf scrubber is still getting established. But I'm looking forward to doing what Jason says, where he scrapes off all this algae and it looks like the size of a baseball and he throws it away. And, uh, you know, if I lose macroalgae in the refugium because, you know, from that thing doing its job and see, he's saying that the turf scrubber is going to lower my nitrate. And so I'm very curious to watch this happen. And uh, I hope it does. So that's what I'm using instead of ginormous water changes. Let's see. Uh, Jace, Jess? Jason Stace says, I love the copper band butterfly. How long have you had it? Have you ever tried a clam with it? Uh, I got the copper band butterfly a year and a half ago, I think. I'm not sure when I got it. A year and a half ago seems about right. And there's no clams in the tank right now. But I also don't feed clam food, so it hasn't, uh, you know, gotten a taste for it. So when I do finally end up buying some clams to put in my tank, Oh, in the back corner there on this video, you can see my uh, Spock. Get out of the way. As usual, she's in the way. Um, in that back corner are all my acans that I've been trying to fill in that little corner. Uh, the I'd like to get some clams. I'd like to get some Maximas. I don't know where I'd put them. <laughs> but I'd like to get some, and I would love to think the copper band's not going to bother them. I have had a copper band in the past with a clam, and nothing happened. So uh, I don't believe it's a, a known problem. Now... Butterflies can do dumb things, and I've seen clams slam down on fish that nipped at them, so there is a chance that could happen. Uh, Alex says, my, I used my last bit of reborn for the calcium reactor. I know they've been out of stock since December. Have you heard any information of when they will restock? What do you recommend in the meantime? So, I don't know anything as fact, but I feel like reborn is going to be here soon. So, uh, just stay tuned. Um, as soon as I can get my hands on it, it'll go back in my shop. Uh, in the meantime, if you absolutely have nothing and you can't do anything, Carib C sells ARM, which is Aragonite Reactor Media, and that works perfectly fine. You know, a lot of people use that for a long time before Reborn came out. And so you do have that opportunity. You'll probably have to change your melt point to a different level for that one than you're used to using with Reborn. You can probably go a little higher um, pH. Uh, Callie, I don't know the answer to your question here. You said you, I use the Red Sea titration kit for, P, for phosphate. I have used the HANA checker, and it always read higher, point, or just 0 0.08 versus 0 0.2 or higher. Has Red Sea been known to read lower? Uh, I don't know the answer to that. Um, I used Red Sea initially way back in 2010. I didn't really love the kit, and I was using Salifert forever for phosphate. It was super easy to use. Then Elos came out, and I felt like Elos was even easier, and I've been just using that ever since. I tried the HANA checker for a while, and it just seemed like more work than it was worth it. And I always have phosphate, so it's not like I'm trying to measure microscopic amounts of phosphate. I have too much in my tank because I feed my babies. But if you have two different numbers from two different kits, you're going to have to pick a kit and live with it. You're just going to have to choose what do I want to believe, what do I want to use. Uh, for me, I just use ELOS, and uh, it is what it is. <clears throat> Uh, Jamie says, have you ever had an issue with emerald crabs ripping apart soft corals? Mine has started attacking the zinnia. Sometimes he eats it, other times he just rips it off and lets it float around. <laughs> Sounds like a punk of a crab. Must be in a rotten mood. Um, it can happen. I've even seen uh, emerald crabs go up to newly planted zoanthids, and they would rip the zoanthids out of the fresh glue to eat the glue. <laughs> Now, I don't know if that, what that tells you about the IQ of a crab if it chooses to eat glue, but there's a joke in there somewhere. Uh, but yeah, sometimes crabs will do dumb things, and sometimes you just have to remove the crab and, uh, and get a different one that's not like that. Uh, if you continually see this one doing damage in your tank, you may have to remove it. You can take it back to the fish store, you can tell them what's happening so they don't put it... Um, 
back up for sale necessarily, they might sell that very crab to someone that has a predator tank that has a fish that likes to eat crabs and it becomes food. So still the circle of life. It's not the most pleasant way of ending its life, but you know, if it's destroying your tank, it's got to go. Nasty Nemo says, how do you keep sponges down? I have lots. Uh, sponges are actually completely normal filter feeders. You don't have to get rid of them, but if you don't like them, you can peel them right off the rock and get rid of it. But uh, I have sponge all growing throughout my system in little crevices, and I just like looking at it. And uh, I feel like it's kind of an indication of a healthy system. Uh, Andy says, what gallons per hour would you recommend for a mixed tank with SPS, LPS, softies? I hear anything from 6 times to 10 to 20 times turnover. Well, it's a really hard one because it's a mixed reef. I have a mixed reef. And uh, my system, my tank is a 400 gallon tank. And my return pump is probably pushing back around 2,000 gallons an hour. And then I have all the Vortex moving water inside the tank. I have two MP60s and an MP40. And I'm using the flow accelerators um, from Vivid Creative Aquatics, VCA. And uh, all that creates the flow you're seeing in the tank. And that seems to work. I mean, right there, you're looking at the video, and that is a mixed reef. You've got LPS, you've got SPS, you've got chalices. Um, there's even softies in the back. There's zoanthids, there's um, pallies, there's uh, leathers in the back. There's a big, huge toadstool in the back, too. Sometimes it's not really how, I mean, you don't want to have so much turnover through the sump that you're sending micro bubbles in the tank. And like you're watching the tank now in this video where the return pump just restarted. So some bubbles are going to appear in this part of the clip a little bit, but then it's going to dissipate and it's going to be crystal clear water again like it always is. And that's very normal. And I don't have all the water coming from the sump. I have water coming up from the sump because I've chosen that, but I rely on in-tank flow. So it's not really... Should I put a 10,000 gallon an hour pump down in the sump? I mean, you should not. Um, but you can have slow flow going through the sump so the filtration can do its job. And then you can use in-tank flow like gyres, um, the Tunzi pumps, the Vortec pumps, the Jabo pumps, and there's so many, you know, the wave pumps from, Ape uh, from Neptune Systems. These are all different pumps that are on the market that give you flow and you can put them wherever you want them in your tank to avoid dead spots and if you see like, for example, SPS corals need a lot of flow, so you need a lot of flow across the top of the reef. But down low where the soft corals are, you need a lot less flow, so you wouldn't have a power head that, that, that low down. You'd have it further up. And as it's pushing water, it's drawing water up from below, and that water is being sucked across the soft corals, and they're not getting hammered, they're not getting blown over, they're not leaning to the side because of the flow. So I, that's kind of my advice. I don't know if that really gets you the answer you're looking for. You're looking for a specific number. Um, three to five turnover through the sump is a very slow number, but works. If you want to go a little bit quicker, you can. It really comes down to how big the sump is, how big the return zone is, how wide apart the baffles are to handle how much flow can go through it without creating cavitation and microbubbles and all those things that make your life miserable. So, relative flow through the sump, better flow in the tank itself from the in-tank powerheads, or a closed loop. All right. Uh, Marine reefs, I have not heard of. I mentioned, I answered your question earlier. I haven't uh, seen it. Uh, I will have to check it out. I haven't used it. I don't know anything. <laughs> Wow, Dave, thank you very much for the super, super chat. That was nice. He said, Mark, I always enjoy your live streams on the weekends. The topics have always related to the reef hobby. Stay safe and go buy yourself a bottle of Crown. Show me the bottle and thank me on the next live stream. Okay, I am going to take a screenshot so I don't do anything other than exactly what you said. So I've got it saved to my desktop, and I will definitely do that. I might buy a better bottle. 
<laughs> but a lot of that money is going to go toward it. Uh, I really, I think I'm going to get Crown Royal Reserve, and uh, that one's like 70, 80 bucks. But thank you for paying for most of it. That's awesome. Spock, no bananas for you this week. <laughs> um, huh, that's a weird one. Proteza, Proteza? <clears throat> says, I have an out-of-the-pack question. Why does Pulsing Zinnia get black polyps? Black? I've never seen Pulsing Zinnia that would turn black. Sounds like it's decaying or dying off. Are these polyps black but still opening and closing completely normal, but just look like they're burned? That's... I'd need to see pictures. If you can post that in Club Mila's Reef, I'd love to see it. Scottish Reefer, you're my new best friend. He says, your Facebook group is by far the friendliest on Facebook. Lovely comments after posting a video of my reef. That's what we like to hear. Yeah, seriously. Um, the moderators and I, we talk every single day, and we discuss all kinds of stuff happening in the group, and we're always looking... Oh, i got to tell you guys a funny story. Funny, funny story. So we have a group chat just for the moderators. And the moderators, you know, moderate this channel when I'm doing live streams, and they moderate you know, Club Milo's Reef to make sure people aren't trying to sell things and make sure no one's being mean and, uh, you know, making sure that, you know, questions are being answered and tagging me if they if I need to be involved, you know, to answer a question. And so they found an option in the mod chat where you could have a nickname. They started nicknaming themselves dumb stuff. You know, just like they picked, oh, I'm going to be this, I'm going to be that. And I was like, okay, enough with all these nicknames. And, but, you know, they're having fun and I was like, whatever. But then... One person made the mistake of saying, <laughs> these nicknames are driving me crazy because they couldn't figure out who was who now. Because, you know, normally it would say Andrea or Eric or Dwayne. And instead it was these weird names and they're like, wait, who is that person? You know, because it was something like, you know, Cornbread. You know, it was just some random thing. Like, okay, who's Cornbread again? And I was like, okay, the nicknames have to be changed. And so I went in and I had to do it. You know, you could only do one at a time, so there's a little bit of a lag. But I renamed all of the moderators Minion 1, Minion 2, Minion 3, Minion 4, Minion 5, Minion 5, Minion 6, Minion 7. And then I put myself as Gru. <laughs> And so when you see the moderators talking to each other, it says Minion 1 said this to Minion 7. Minion 5 laughed at Minion 7's comment. Yeah, it was so great. And so right now we've been playing that for a couple of days, but I'm sure it'll go back to regular names soon. But I was, we were saying, God, the group doesn't even know how funny we are. <laughs> so I thought, oh, I'll share it on the stream because that was silly. Uh, Kevin Jones says, what do reefers use for backup power? There's a lot of different things you can do. Um, the first thing you can do is use a power inverter. And that is something that hooks up to some kind of a car battery or even the battery in your car. And then you run a long cord from the power inverter to plug in the most basic of things um, because it can't handle a, a massive load. If you've ever bought a power inverter in your life, some people do, like they'll say, well, I want to be able to charge my laptop while I'm driving cross country. And then they plug it in and nothing happens. Like, wow. And the power inverter was not nearly big enough, couldn't handle the wattage. So you got to make sure you know what you're trying to power. But uh, power inverter is one method. Another one is going to be battery powered things like uh, a bubbler, an air pump that actually has batteries inside of it, whether it's batteries you put in it or some kind of a USB charging thing like cobalt cells. I actually have been wanting to put those in my shop for some time because I thought some of you could benefit from it. It's a little air pump that plugs in with a USB wire and it charges the batteries within it, and then if it senses a power outage, it starts pumping air into an air stone that's in your tank. So it's kind of like you have an air stone in your tank at all times, and you'd probably have to put a check valve on that line too to make sure that this thing doesn't back siphon water out of your tank. But, you know, I haven't used it yet, so I don't have an opinion yet. But the idea is that if the power goes out, it automatically starts bubbling oxygen into, or air bubbles into the tank to keep things okay for a little while. But those are like minimal solutions. On a big tank like mine, you want something bigger. And uh, you could use UPSs, but they're not very efficient for a lot of what we do. Because if you have any kind of a product, any kind of a pump that has one of those power bricks, you're going from AC power has been stored as DC power inside the UPS. You plug in your AC cord that feeds into the black brick that switches it to DC, and then it goes up to the pump. And that is a terrible waste of power, and the UPS won't last long because it's creating 110 volts to put out 12 volts. 
and you want to use the 12 volt battery for the 12 volt pump, just straight. So Ecotech and IceCap both have battery backups designed for certain pumps where if the power goes out, it trickles out the 12 volts straight to the pump and keep those things running. So Vortex keep going, gyres keep going. Um, I don't know what else. There's other, uh, the Blade is another pump that probably works with the ice cap battery backup. So you've got that. And then finally, the best option always is going to be a generator. And you can buy a generator at Harbor Freight. You can buy a generator at Home Depot or Lowe's. Um, the bigger, the better. Um, but they're very noisy. I mean, if you are thinking about no power in your neighborhood, everything's dead silent, and then you're out there and you pull the cord and start that gasoline power generator, you're like a lawnmower, and that thing is going to keep running every minute until power is restored. And if your power's out for a day or two, your neighbors are listening to for a day or two. And if anything, it also tells them, hey, that guy's got power, which then there's kind of a slight risk too, you know, is anyone going to mess with you? Also, you have to have the generator outside. You can't have it inside your house. And that means you have to crack a door or window to bring an extension cord from the generator to your tank. And there's the risk of the fumes getting into your house through the cracked door or window. So you might have to pack something around it to keep the fumes out, outside in a way so you don't get headaches, so you don't get carbon monoxide poisoning. And then, of course, if you're super wealthy, and uh, I am not one of those people, you could have a whole house generator that turns on completely automatically if the power goes out for whatever, a second. And it just switches and it just comes to life. And I, I'm assuming those are quieter because of the way they're made. And they either run on natural gas or they run on propane. And that would give you power to your entire house. Nothing would skip a beat. And then, you know, when power is restored, it shuts itself off and that power's come back on again. But so I told you basically from the cheapest all the way up to the most expensive. These are different ways of doing it. Myself, I have battery backups all over my my tank that are made by Ecotech and they have motorcycle batteries in them, but I'm tired of buying new batteries. They're expensive. And I kind of want to get like giant deep sea batteries like you might use for a boat and maybe daisy chain them and then run the wires to all the pumps from one certain spot and use a trickle charger. I think I might go that route at some point, build some kind of an enclosure to keep the battery safe. And uh, also I'm almost a hundred percent certain if you have any kind of like a regular car battery that you're going to use a deep cycle battery, it needs to be put on top of something like lumber, like, you know, two by sixes or something. So it's not sitting directly on the floor because I think a battery sitting directly on the concrete slab of your house drains the battery power. So I think it has to be up a little bit, you know, on top of some lumber. All right. Uh, Russ says, I just did my first DIY semi-automatic water change using the ice cap ATO with a pump in the salt water while I was vacuuming water out. Huh. Said it only works on a small tank and I had to stop periodically to let the ATO catch up. <laughs> I believe it. That's, uh, that's one way of doing it. Um, that's becoming more and more popular with automatic water changes. Uh, John says, do you feed any reef nutrition or other live foods? Did you seed your new sump with any pods. Um, I did seed my refugium with some pods that I got from Algae Barn, I believe, or Pod My Reef, one of those two companies. I got them while I was at Aquashella and I came home and just poured them in the refugium. And uh, I haven't used reef nutrition in a while. And I actually wanted to. I was actually talking with one of their guys back in December saying, you know, I want to get my hands on a big bottle of Arctopods because I want to pour those in the tank you know, every day and, and spoil my babies. <laughs> so uh, he was like, yeah, let's do it. And of course, I didn't follow through on that. But, you know, it'll probably happen. But for most part, it's frozen food. It's Rod's food, P.E. Mysis, um, Hikari Mini Mysis. Uh, I have some pellet food from Reef Nutrition. I have some flake food from Instant Ocean. Um, Benarif, which I use once a week because I always forget to use it. I really want to get to the habit of using it twice a week and I always forget until someone posts, hey, I just used it. I'm like, oh yeah. And then that night I'll use it. Uh, the Grim Reefer says, is there a rule of thumb in working out how many peppermint shrimp you need for a system? I've never heard of one. Um, I, you're saying for Aptasia control, I'm assuming. And I like some peppermint, an uh, pep <laughs> I would love a peppermint angelfish. Uh, the uh, I've had some peppermint shrimp in the past, and you know I'd put in a few in my tank, 
The only downside is they're kind of aggressive and they will steal food right out of the mouths of corals, which is kind of a pain. And I had some peppermints in the anemone cube to work on Aptasia and they were picking and destroying fungias. And that was really bothering me. And then eventually the problem just kind of took care of itself and there was just no more peppermints. I don't know what happened, but uh, <laughs> there's plenty of Aptasia. <laughs> but I've never heard of like, well, if you have 100 Aptasia, you need three peppermints. And if you have 1,000 Aptasia, you need 30. I've never heard anything like that. Well, that's a good question. <laughs> Michael says, how successful have you been keeping on recording your tank parameters each week on Reef Trace? I downloaded the app. I love it. I recommend it to everyone since I don't use the Apex anymore. I set this goal at the beginning of the year and I said I was going to do it every single week and I have missed a few weeks and I'm going to put in today's parameters and I have last week's parameters to put in so I've got a couple I can enter but I'm missing some there in the middle. I I'm sure I can blame it on COVID-19. <laughs> But no, I really wanted to do it every week for the entire year. That was my goal, and I failed already. We're barely into April. Um, Heather says, I'm setting up a 75-gallon tank with a Triton sump. I want something that will last. The Red Dragons and the A100 have come up as options. I'm on the fence as the A100 is overkill. Thoughts? So the Abyss A100 is an awesome pump. Costs a lot of money, guaranteed, warrantied 10 years. And I use the A200 on my reef. And I've been running it for the last couple of years. And I've taken it apart to clean it once in that time. Actually, twice. Once I tried to clean it, I wasn't sure what I was doing. I didn't want to break it. <laughs> and so I stopped. And then when I was at Mac, I said, show me how you take that part off. And of course, it came right off in front of them. So when I came home, I was able to do it the second time I cleaned it. But it's a great pump. And it does have the ability, I haven't done it, but you can buy a cable for like 80 bucks and you can connect the Abyss directly to your Apex to control it even more. So if you decide to go that way. Um, the Red Dragon is uh, not is probably half the price of the Abyss and it has a pretty good warranty, but when you need a new one, how quickly can you get another Red Dragon pump is the question. Or are you going to buy two and put one on the shelf? And so you're probably thinking, well, does Mark have a second Abyss on the shelf? No, I do not. I bought something from My Reef Creation. It's a big, beefy pump, and it's in the back room, and it's brand new, and it's set aside for if I ever need it, I can hook it up. And that pump was $500. And I just wanted to have a pump on hand so that if this thing decides to kick the bucket and I have to send it in for repairs and warranty work and it takes three weeks, I've got a pump that will move the water in my tank from the minute I discover the problem until I get the pump back. So that would, that's kind of the thing. No matter what you, and I just had a customer this week said, Mark, do you have the Vectra S2 in stock? And I said, yeah, I do. And he said, I've been meaning to buy one as a backup for weeks or months, and I just burned it up today. <laughs> and so I need it. And I was like, no problem. I shipped it the next day. And having the pump on hand as your backup in case yours fails is so important. So whatever you're going to buy, you need to have a second one or some kind of alternative ready to go so that way you can you know, make a change and keep your tank going. Red Dragon has a good reputation, but I don't know how long the warranty is. Abyss has a great reputation, and uh, they've updated their drivers too, which is kind of cool. Uh, Providence Tidal Reef says, I'm setting up a 75-gallon. What brand of skimmer would you recommend? I'm going to be running a refugium with Calerpa, Feather Calerpa. Should I downsize the skimmer? No, I would get the right size skimmer for your tank, and I would point you to Nios. I really like their skimmer. I would get the next size up. Let me see which one that is, because I always mix up my model numbers. It's uh, I would get the Quantum 160. It's rated 70 gallons all the way up to 265 gallons, which I think might be a little high. But uh, that way, if you upgrade your 75 later on and you uh, end up with like a 240, you've got a skimmer you can still use. Should be kind of nice. Uh, the smallest Nios is rated right for yours, but I'm running the smallest one and I and it's on a 60 gallon and I feel like I want the next size up and I'm probably gonna get the next size up. So that's why I'm recommending you to do that. So I wouldn't get the smallest one, I get the the model 160, I think I told you. 
that would be my recommendation. Fish Whistler says, how do you get rid of small white snails that come up on the glass at night? You don't, and you go to sleep, and you don't think about it. Just let them do their thing. They're snails. And you know what? All day you don't see them. They come up at night, that's okay. Then they go back down. They're grazers. They're totally fine. James Wagner says, I tested my parameters before joining the stream. Everything looks great. Dude, you're ahead of me. Well done. Look, there's all these people posting their test results right here in the live chat. Jared says, I tested my water yesterday. It was 8.7 for alkalinity, 410 for calcium, 1400 magnesium. Nitrate is 6. Come on, you're such an overachiever. Uh, phosphate is 0.04, and alkalinity, uh, salinity was 1.026. Perfect. Hello, Donald. He says, what's up? Uh, South Junction says, I ordered a grow light from Amazon, and it should have been a 75-watt pink light, but they sent me a blue and white light. Can I use it to grow algae in my refugium? Yes, you can. Um, but if you want pink, you should send it back and get the pink one. But using white light or white and blue light is fine. I mean, look at all the reef tanks with regular lights growing algae. <laughs> and people are like, oh no, I have algae in my tank. So, uh, yeah, uh, the pink light just grows algae faster, but it looks hideous. And I can't stand it. But that is my personal preference, or lack thereof. Uh, Brian's Reef says, at what point should you consider dosing amino acids? Should you avoid dosing at certain nitrate and phosphate levels? Um, I haven't heard that a lack of those would be a, a, a problem. Amino acids is one of those things that some people swear by them and other people say I can't tell the difference. And I have been dosing amino acids in my tank automatically for the last couple of months. Once a week it goes in, and uh, it's not very much. But I think Dwayne's SPS tank, I feel like he doses amino acids daily into his tank, and he grows corals hand over fist. He grows them so fast. So uh, you might want to double check. But here's something. Let me jump into a story. Um, I, I read a, a comment in Club Milo's Reef. I better put that on here again for you guys to remind you where you're supposed to be when you're not on the live stream. So Club Meals Reef, this guy posted how he was having problems in his tank and his corals weren't growing and his nitrate and phosphate were not zero. You know, they were where they needed to be, nice and low, but they existed. But the corals just weren't doing anything. And, you know, he was just like, what's the deal? And so he told us he started dosing trace elements, and all of a sudden all of his corals started growing, and everything started to come into play, and his alkaline and his calcium and magnesium were being absorbed and used more than before. And I thought that was kind of fascinating, because I never think about trace elements. I just, I just don't think about them. And, you know, I know you asked about amino acids, but trace elements is another one. And, you know, the old school rule of thumb was never put anything in your tank you can't test. And we can't test trace elements. We might get some information back on an ICP test, but we can't just pull out a test kit and find out if trace elements are good, medium, or bad, you know? <laughs> we don't have like a number one to 10 on trace elements. So it's sort of like a guess. You know, you take the lid off the bottle, you shake it up, you know, you take the lid off the bottle and you put in the amount that they recommend and then you just kind of like, now what? And this guy had made the comment that since dosing trace elements, his corals started growing and his consumption levels of the alkaline and calcium were, and magnesium were all shifting. They were finally doing it instead of staying stationary. And uh, he said, I've solved the problem. And I was like, man, I never would have thought of trace elements. So that's kind of one of those things that I probably need to do more homework on and possibly you guys might want to look into and uh, do some Google searches during your downtime and see what you can find out from some of the experts that know stuff about trace elements that I do not know anything about. I just, I've never really gave it a lot of thought. Um, Graham says, I just joined the group, and it's great. Thank you. I fed my nanotank last night. I fed more food than usual as I decided, or as I added for the new scolemia and the anco, an, acanthophilia. The, uh, yeah, feeding those corals is important. They, they definitely need to get their 
belly is full, and you can do that once or twice a week. Um, you can also do broadcast feeding like Ben Arif. But you asked, what is the white bloom? I don't understand what you're asking there, so I can't answer your question. I apologize. <clears throat> Uh, Donald says, I'm new to salt water. Quick question, is a sump beneficial on a nano tank? You know, if you had this beautiful, tiny, little 12-gallon nano tank, and you had a 150-gallon sump underneath it, I would not judge you one bit because you would have a massive water volume. You could keep the water super stable, and you could have this beautiful gem of a tank with, like, perfection because you're not going to worry about pollution because you've got the filtration. But... If you have a little tiny 12-gallon tank and you try to put a 5-gallon sump underneath it, it's going to be a struggle because there's so little space to do anything. And just the water draining down, let's say you drain it into a 4-inch sock in a 5-gallon tank, and then you hope to squeeze in a nano skimmer, and then you need a little tiny pump to push it up, and you're like, wow, there's not even room for a heater in here. It can be very frustrating. But any kind of sump does benefit. And so what I like to recommend anyone in your situation, try to get a stand bigger than the tank that has room underneath for something larger. So you can actually put in a nice sump, put the nano on top, have room around it to put things down and to work in your tank and, you know, to set down a drink. You know, and that way you have the space underneath and you can have top off, you can have skimming, you can run carbon, you can uh, dose elements, you can hide the electronics, you know, the, the electrical plugs and everything can all be safe underneath in this larger stand. And I'm not saying go with a huge stand, not like the size of a desk, but if you have a cute little tank and you put it on a stand that gives you about six inches all the way around it on three sides, that's great, because you just added a foot more space underneath, and you added some space in the front, too. So that would be my suggestion. And, you know, it, it just comes down to your budget, too, and your space in the room. You know, you might have found that nano fits perfectly, but I don't have room for bigger furniture. So then you might decide, okay, forget it. I'm just going to do an all-in-one and make it work. Uh, Sky and Sea says, how much would it cost to ship Live Rock Enhanced to Europe? I believe one jar is $14, and I think two jars puts the weight up just enough that it becomes like $21. But if you'll email me what you're wanting, you know, how many and, you know, what you want, and your postal code, I can do a search and find out what the price is and tell you in advance. Um, and then you can decide if you want to do it or not. Uh, Chaz says, I'm dosing Nopox. I'm 0.14 on phosphate, and I'm 1 on nitrate. How do I bring up nitrate and lower phosphate? Well, the nopox will lower the phosphate. That's its job. You might have to dose some nitrate because normally the way nopox works is it pulls down the phosphate first and then it pulls down the nitrate. It, it's... I think I have that right. And uh, in your situation, your phosphate's up a little higher and your nitrate's already super low. It's almost like you shouldn't use nopox. Maybe instead... Your nitrate's at 1, you could just let it be, or let it be 1, 2, 3, or 5, or 7, or something low in that range, and just use something like Phosphate Rx to knock down the phosphate and stop using Nopox. Anfield says, uh, thanks for your help with the, the other day with my Red Sea test kit. Um, it came in and he tested magnesium was 1450, so the ICP test must have been wrong. Uh, it's possible. I mean, not every single reading is right. And uh, the new issue of Coral Magazine that's coming out um, probably in the next few weeks, because we have the current March-April edition, so that means uh, May-June is about to hit, that's going to have an entire article on ICP analysis on, you know, the different companies testing and people's... Um, they did a huge poll from everyone that uses IP t ICP tests to give feedback, and I can't wait to read it. I really am curious to see, because I've heard good and bad. And, uh, you know, we're, we, were, we are relying on ICP to help us be more accurate and to really dial in our tanks. And if we cannot believe the result being sent to us, that's a problem. So we, I, I, wouldn't, I can't wait to see what they wrote. But yeah, it's possible you got a bad reading. I sent in one, I did a, a different company for an ICP test, <clears throat> and it came back with some weird number. I said, how did you get this number? And uh, he said, well, we tested it with such and such. And I was like, are you kidding me? I have one of those. I can do that myself. <laughs> so anyway, he said, can we send in another sample? I'm like, yes, but I was kind of a little bit perturbed. So anyway, I'm looking forward to seeing what the article has to say. Tim, thank you very much for the super chat. I appreciate it. It's going toward the Crown Royal Reserve, sir. 
Um, Tim says, my 29 gallons pH stays around 7.8, but my water for the water changes is 8.4. Should I fix the pH if I'm changing 5 to 10 gallons? So how are you measuring your pH in the first place? Are you using a pH probe? Are you using a pH test kit? Are, and when are you testing? Because if you're testing your tank early in the morning before the lights come on, it could be 7.8. If you test it around, I don't know, 7 p.m. while your lights have been cooking the tank for half the day, the number should be more like 8.1, 8.2. Um, not really sure why your pH is so low in the tank. And you know that's impressive that your new salt water has a, such a high pH. It's not really common. Anyway, the best thing you could own to really dial this in would be to get an American pinpoint pH meter. And it kind of looks like the size of your cell phone, but thicker. <laughs> and it has a pH probe, and you can put it in the tank, and it'll tell you in the digital display instantly what the pH is. And then you can just take it out of the tank, and you can put it inside your barrel of salt water, and you can measure that one and see if they're the same. Because I don't really believe pH test kits. I never have. I've never liked them. The American Pinpoint was my tool to use for years and years and years. I've even thought about buying one, even though I barely need it. But I was like, but when you do, you need to have one. <laughs> <laughs> and so I, I haven't pulled the trigger on it yet, but I've thought about it. <laughs> so Reef and Chill says, what's up, Mark? And then he says, I'm chilling in the background with a cold one. Cheers to quarantine life. I like that his name is Reef and Chill, and then he tells us he is actually chilling. And I can't wait to do the same when I get off this stream. Uh, Nathan says, uh, I ordered the extra DI container. Thanks for the shipping refund. Yep, that's what I do. And he says, also it was fast and wrapped great. Yeah, I, I wanted to get you in one piece. I am so over the top when it comes to packing things. I just, I wanted to get there. I, You know those little rings that I sell that goes around the Nero 5 to keep your snails and fish out? I ship that in a little tiny box that's four inches by four inches by four inches. It's a hard little box. And somebody received it crushed, and they broke the 3D printed part inside. And I was just like, man, I can't believe it. And that wasn't just like thrown in the box with nothing. I had the packing peanuts in there, <laughs> so it won't shift. And they still found a way to break it. I was like, man. So I sent them another one. But uh, yeah, no, I, I really do spend a lot of time packing things, so that's really solid. Uh, Coral Lovers says, how long do you run your algae scrubber hours per day? I'm running the lights 12 hours a day. So from midnight 30 to 1230 uh, noon, I run the lights and then it's off from 1230 all the way until midnight 30 again. And that's just because, unfortunately, the lights have cooling fans that blow and I don't want to hear the fans because my tank is so quiet that when those come on, I'm just like, Ooh. I'm like, I'm going to bed. <laughs> and then, you know, in the morning I get up, I make coffee, the television's on, I don't really hear it. Or the dehumidifier is running, which makes it enough noise anyway. It masks. I mean, really, the algae turf scrubber and the dehumidifier run at the same time every single night, and I just go to bed. And uh, that's worked out really well for me. Uh, Jason, the guy that made that, and it's his product, he told me, if you want more success, you should run the lights 18 hours. I'm like, nope. <laughs> I'm not going to listen to those fans for another six hours. No way. Now, my daytime, I like it kind of quiet. So um, I'm letting it run when I'm not in the room with it. Uh, Reef and Dive says, how's the neck going? It's doing terribly. The last three or four days has been so bad. I sat down on the computer this morning to edit this video you're watching just to, you know, get it into one clip. So here was what I was hoping to do. And I, I mentioned this earlier, but maybe you weren't here yet. I wanted to broadcast this video from my MacBook Pro on this television screen behind me. And then I, I set up the live stream. I put the camera on top and I turned on the television and I had the video playing and all I saw was blue. I was like, you gotta be kidding me. It doesn't look like, you know, nice clean footage. Why does it look so blue? So that's why we're actually playing it inside the stream software, which seems to be working, but I haven't watched the playback yet on YouTube. I haven't seen what the quality looks like, but you know, on my side, it looks decent. But uh, anyway, when I was editing the video, my neck was bothering me. It felt like something was burning, you know, inside the, inside of my spine and my hand was getting numb. I was like, oh my God. And what I did a few months ago, I, I, it was back in January, it was around my birthday, and I decided I'm gonna start walking every day 30 minutes. And I did that for about a month and a half, and my neck wasn't bothering me nearly as much. And I've always heard walking is good for you, just for regular health. And I was thinking, 
I haven't walked for like the last two months. And you know, my neck is bothering me again. So maybe I should just get back to walking and uh, maybe walk earlier in the day or walk late at night, you know, whenever I'm not walking into any other people. And uh, the problem is Texas gets very hot. And so, you know, this is April. Actually, the weather today is phenomenal. Uh, right now, the temperature is 77 degrees. Uh, this morning, it was like 69. I walked out, I was like, oh, it's better out here. I, I want to do the live stream outside. <laughs> but uh, I think if I go walking, maybe it'll loosen up whatever's going on. And, uh, or I'm going to start having to stand at my desk to work, you know, and not sit. I don't know what's going on. I constantly am looking at my posture. How am I sitting? How are my arms? You know, how is my, you know, trunk? Try to get all right, but ugh, it's been really bad. And I'm like, what is different? What has changed? Nothing. Nothing's new other than me hauling a ton of branches to the curb last weekend. Uh, Sky and Sea says, what upcoming future reefing tech are you looking forward to? Oh, you know, a couple of things that I see, usually what happens is I go to Macna and I see the latest product and I get excited about that. And last Macna, I saw a new magnetic stirrer that would charge with the USB wire, like everything. And I was like, oh, I can't wait for that to come out. And that way I could sell it on my shop and you guys could get it because it's so much nicer to do your tests when you have that thing stirring the solution. You don't have to shake the vial. And that's the only way I test my water every single time. I'm still using the same one I did a video about, like, what, three years ago? Maybe four? Where I have a magnetic stirrer that someone 3D printed and sent to me as a gift. And I use it every time I test my water. And I love it. And... They came out with one that was nice, and I said, hey, you should have a white light behind the vial so we can see the color really clearly. And the guy says, okay, we're on it. And that was last year, and I had never heard if they ever finished the project, if it's available. Um, I need to look and find out, because Coral View loves to have new products, and I just don't even, I'm not even aware of it until someone tells me. I'm like, what? Why didn't they tell me they have that? I would have sold that. <laughs> and that's one, you know, it's a minor thing, but those little tools that make your life so much easier are worth their weight in gold. I mean, they're just amazing. So I like that. Uh, Reef and Chill says, do you consider vermited snails a deal breaker? Uh, introduced by LPS corals, planning to upgrade using new rock and starting over to avoid all risks of transferring them, considering just living with them. Well, they're not a deal breaker. And there are a few in my tank, and when I say a few, there might be seven. And uh, it's one of those things, like, I really should go up there and just snip those off and just solve it. But there are people out there with a tank that just is like a porcupine with thousands and thousands of them. And when you see that many, then it's a problem. You know, when you have a small handful, something you can manage or handle or scrape off, and you're setting up a new tank, you can definitely knock off the ones that you see, because they're very obvious. Even out of water, they have a little calcified tube it's very you just break that thing off put a drop of glue on there and put the rock in your new tank and just keep going i wouldn't uh no i wouldn't say it's a deal breaker i would have to see the condition of how badly the rock is infested but odds are i would scrape off the majority probably miss a few and put it in the tank uh starship reefing says i have some aeolid flatworms i've siphoned some out what else would you recommend to get rid of them it's a 40 gallon breeder with a sump and a skimmer and a 32 gallon bio cube with no skimmer. You can siphon it out and then you can treat with flatworm exit and you need to follow the directions very carefully that are on my website of how to treat for flatworms because I believe like my advice is the best way of doing it. It definitely works my way really well and you don't lose livestock. Um, and that's why I recommend you follow my directions. And if you just treat the tank to kill them off and then do your big water change and run some carbon, You've solved it. And if you want to do it three weekends in a row to eliminate any possible leftover stragglers, that's even smarter. But then, you know, once you're done, you'll never have them again. And that's really sweet. So it's better than trying to uh, vacuum them out or putting a fish that may eat them or putting a nudibranch that might slurp them up. You know, it's just so hit or miss. There's no guarantee they'll get every last one. It's just not how nature works. Uh, and Sky and Sea says, what else can clownfish host in other than anemone? They'll live in almost anything. It could be frilly mushrooms, hairy mushrooms. It could be in LPS corals. It could be in a leather coral. Um, I've seen them 
snuggle up to a power head. I've seen them snuggle up inside a clam. I mean, there's all kinds of silly stuff. The end of our video. So we have been at this now for an hour and 44 minutes. Do we run the video one more time? <laughs> Hit a thumbs up if you want me to do another run of the video. Because that's the one where you see the results quickly. My coffee is 71 degrees. Ugh. So cold. Reuben says, my rose bubble tip anemone and corals seem to close up when the lights go off at night. Is this normal and healthy? Yes, that is exactly normal. You might even see the anemones close up like a ball of socks. <laughs> Reaving for Fun sent a super chat specifically for the banana fund for Spock. Thank you so much. <laughs> Look at all those thumbs up. Fine, fine. You want to see the video. I get it. <laughs> all right. Now that the DJ is done doing his music. <laughs> I actually liked seeing all the thumbs up because on my screen, it was like a bouquet of them came out of my screen. That was kind of neat. I hadn't seen that. Normally I see one go up or two, but it was like 15. Went boom. Like confetti. And I don't know how to say your name. Stviger? <laughs> Thank you very much for the super chat. I appreciate it. Uh, Walid's Reef says, do you prefer a frag tank to be connected to the display tank or be separate? It depends what you're trying to accomplish, but man, is it easier if it's connected to the main system because then all you've done is added more water and a spot to work with corals. And you don't have to worry about skimmers, heaters, dosing, uh, temperature control. It's all being handled by the main reef already. So I love that. Mine is standalone. <laughs> it looks horrible. And I have not spent the time on it. I've been spending time on my reef. I'm trying to spend time on my anemone cube and get things just the way I like it. And then I will finally put my energy into that, uh, that frag system. And I set it up completely separate on purpose. I wanted it separate, number one, because I didn't want to step across the pipes. You know, for I go through that doorway to get to the workshop, and I walk in and out of that door, I don't know, 50 times a day, and I didn't want to have to step over plumbing pipes 50 times a day for the rest of my life. And there was no way to get the pipes anywhere else. So I made it standalone, and the second reason I made it standalone was so that way, if somebody says, hey, can you test a skimmer? Can you test a product? Can you test a light? I had a small system I could put it on that was, you know, around 60, 70 gallons versus them saying, hey, we want you to try out our skimmer. I'm like, well, I need one rated for 450 gallons. And then they're, they're like, well, we can't do that. I'm like, yeah, I understand. <laughs> so I thought if I have a smaller system that's doing well and I have to test something, I can, and it's separate. But that tank has not done well for some time. And I've, I've mentioned it many streams, many, probably, probably 30 streams I've said I need to reset it. And I've started doing water changes on it. I've been cleaning the skimmer. I've been cleaning the sump. I've been, you know, I've been working on it. I even worked on the refugium a little bit. But I want to just kind of overhaul it, and I want to drain it and change the plumbing on it, and I'm going to need some time, but I am literally focusing on my customers every single day and putting those kind of projects off because the customers paid for a product, and I need to take care of them. And uh, there's just not enough hours in the day, so it's on hold. All right, next question. Uh, Anfield says, is there a product that helps coralline to grow without buffering KH? You know, uh, Purple Up, I don't believe buffers anything. And that has been a known thing to use to increase your coralline growth in the tank. I think what it was, was the, uh, the product itself has aragonite media in it, which coralline loves. And I think it had iodine in it and something else. <laughs> and whatever that is, it helped grow coralline in a tank. But if you don't want to use any kind of a product that could have possibly affect your alkalinity, you could actually get something with coralline and put it in your tank and let it spread from there. For example, if you were to get cleanup crew that has coralline on their shells, it'll spread into your tank. If you see any coralline growing on, usually it grows on plastic first. If you see it on the lock line, if you see it on PVC pipe, if you see it on the cleaning magnet, 
scrape it off and send the shavings into your reef and you'll put little bits of coralline everywhere that will stick and start appearing. And then if you maintain really good stable water parameters, it will just grow naturally. Uh, coralline also needs magnesium, it's very important. There's probably a lot of magnesium in purple up. And w when I am not dosing coralline, uh, no, <laughs> when I'm not dosing magnesium, my glass shows no indication of coralline. And then when I start, like when I refill the bottle and set up the dosing pump to run again, within a few days I start seeing spots on the glass for coralline starting to happen. And so I know magnesium is an important part of it as well. Also, you may see coralline growing in areas where it's dark versus the very bright areas, like lower in the tank. On my tank, it grows on the end by the overflow box, which you'll see in this video from time to time, depending what angle we're looking at. And I haven't scraped it off. But if you scrape off the walls of your tank and you scrape off the back of your tank, those shavings will land on the reef and they'll start growing on the rock work itself. You don't even see my rock work because there's corals everywhere. <laughs> so my rock work can't have coralline on it because there's none there. Now, other products like Live Rock Enhance and uh, Reef Enhance could help nourish coralline to grow as well. But it's not an actual coralline product. Reef and Dive, thank you very much for the super chat. Sometimes the chats come through a little differently, and, but I'm assuming that is a super chat, and I didn't want to ignore it. I thought somebody asked me something about a light. Did I ignore that? I was going to answer it. Nope, I answered it. Okay, good. Uh, Proteza, thank you. I would love to see it. Uh, so yes, please do post that in Club Miller's Reef. Tag me. You can tag Mark Levinson or you can tag Miller's Reef Inc. And, uh, or tell the moderators, tag Mark. <laughs> <laughs> and they'll tag me, and that way I can see it. I want to see what you got going on. That's very interesting. This person had said that some of their zinnia polyps were black, and uh, I've never seen that before, so I want to see it. Ed, thank you very much. He says over 300 people are watching the stream, and he's right. It's 319. And only 51 likes. Show Mark some love and hit that like button. <laughs> so, uh, just so you know, there are obviously thumbs up inside the chat, which is great. It's like instant information, lets me know if you like something or not. Um, but you have to actually exit the chat on your device to actually put a like on a video and then, you know, come right back to the chat. You won't, the chat doesn't evaporate, it just, you have to exit out to do that and come back in. And I do that for other streams when I'm watching someone else's and I will exit out, give them the like, and I come back into the, the chat. That's how it works. Let's see. <laughs> Marcus says, I always notice every video has at least one thumbs down. Yeah, it's my superpower. <laughs> I, I know how to offend one person for sure every video. Maybe that was Than. I bet it was Than. <laughs> that guy at Tidal Gardens, He's doing a stream and he his phone, his computer bar goes ding. Milo's Reef is doing a live stream. He's like thumbs down. You interrupted my stream. That's probably what it is. <laughs> I don't think that's him. That's too funny. Let's see. <laughs> I'm seeing all these uh, thumbs up happening. Thanks, guys. Robert, greetings from Texas. He says greetings from London. Hope you guys are staying safe over there. So I've got a friend who I've known for a very long time. And he, uh, I reached out to him recently and asked him how he was doing. And he says, I moved to London during all this COVID mess. I mean, he, he was already living there and now he's there. And because of it, they were under the same quarantine stuff that we're dealing with here in the U.S. where you couldn't go out and about and he was stuck there. Well, he recently got married, and I had seen his pictures back in January when they went to Maui, and he married this beautiful woman. And so I said, how are things going? And he said, she is in Russia, in Moscow, and she can't be with him. Oh, I'm sorry, not he wasn't in London. Well, it doesn't matter. It's just the point of the story is they're separated. Uh, he was in Italy, and Italy was like a major hotspot. And he was staying safe. He was lucky. But she was in Moscow, and because of the quarantine, she could not be with him. And they're newly married. And I felt so bad for him, because that's just, ugh. You know? You just never know what's going to happen. 
got to keep your loved ones close. And uh, hopefully soon things will get better and they can get back together again. Maybe by now they have. I don't know. I haven't talked to them in about a week and a half. Anchor says, at least I made it before this ended. Hello to you too, sir. Uh, Macy's Daddy says, I added a T5 LED hybrid light to my AI Hydras. Do you have a T5 light bulb recommendation to put in the T5 section? I don't. Um, there was a guy many years ago who was like a wizard when it came to T5s, and he could tell you what orientation to put them in, like, you know, what color back to back. Uh, I used to run Power Compacts a long time ago, and then I did VH, uh, yeah, VHOs. And the rule was put the blue ones in front and put the white ones behind it. But with T5s, you'll have a Fiji pink, you'll have a purple, you'll have a blue, you'll have a pink, you'll have a, a white. And you've got to put them in a certain order to get the right look of the tank. And I don't have like a, a recipe for that, I'm sorry. But there are others out there that run T5s that could probably give you the insight. Now you can ask in Club Miller's Reef, or you could get a hold of Tulio at Reef Bright, because he is like all things lighting, and he sells T5, so he would probably have some really good advice on what order of bulbs to go in to get the optimal look. But I would think you're going to start with purples and blues closer to you, and then the pinks and whites in the back. So you have like this band of blue you're looking through, instead of looking through a band of pink or a band of white. I hope that makes sense, but that's, you know, find out from someone that knows that's doing it. I haven't run T5s in forever. I bought T5s when they first came out, and I tried them out briefly, and they were burning up because they were such new products, they didn't last. You know, they would just burn out, and I'd take it to the store, and they'd give me another one, and they'd just fail. And I was like, okay, I'm just going to stick with VHOs because they work. <laughs> and they've been working for a long time. And then over, the, over years, T5s got better. And then for a while there, and they might still exist, they made a T5 bulb that was, an, I think they called it an E bulb, and it looked like a T5, but it was with the T5 ends, but I think it was LEDs inside of it. And I thought, oh, that's kind of cool. And then I mentioned this in a previous stream when I was at Macna with Tulio and his Reef Bright booth. He had T5 set up over a tank with uh, some other lighting, and he said, touch them. I'm like, nope, not going to touch them. Those are hot. He goes, no, seriously, you can touch it. I was like, I'm not going to do it. And he goes, Mark, seriously, you can put your hand on there. So I said, all right, fine. You know, and I put my hand, and they were not hot. And I was like, how did you do that? And he goes, that's a secret. I can't tell you that. He says, but the fact my bulbs don't run as hot means they last longer than the average T5 bulb. And I thought, well, that's huge because people have to keep buying new bulbs every year or every nine months. And if you can have a bulb last 15 months or 18 months because it doesn't run as hot, that's good financially for the hobbyist. So it's nice to know there are brands out there that have better longevity. So that's what I was saying. Talk with Tulio at ReefBright if you have questions about T5s. And if you want to buy his bulbs, that's up to you. Uh, Dan says, do you ship to Cambridge, Ontario in Canada? Yes, I do. I ship all kinds of things to Canada. Uh, all I need is your postal code, and I can, get, I can get you a quote. Obviously, it costs more than shipping in the U.S., but yes, I can do it. Uh, Drama D says, I want to install a flow meter on a three-quarter inch pipe. Should I use a half-inch flow meter something up or a one-inch flow meter reduced down? <laughs> he said undoosed up. <laughs> Does it matter if one is better than the other? I would go with a larger one. I would not go with a smaller one because the smaller one will create resistance and friction and you lose flow because of the narrowness of that spot you put in the line. So I would go larger. So I would... Um, reduce down where you have to. But I would not undo up. <laughs> I thought it was a typo. <laughs> Let's see. I'm looking for the next question. That's me using that easy blade I was telling you about. And I showed some close-ups of it in my six-year anniversary video. We are uh, six and a half years in now. Let's see, December, January, February, March, April. Yeah, 
No. Six years, five months. That's where we are in this tank right now. Um, S Stephen, or Stefan, might be saying it wrong, uh, says, I'm having trouble raising nitrate. Currently, nitrate is measuring 0, 0.00. Yeah, that's zero. <laughs> and phosphate is 0 0.07. Even with heavy feeding and dosing Seachem Flourish to up the NO3, or the nitrate, for four weeks. Um, there are products designed to raise nitrate, and then there's products that are not designed for it that people use anyway, like tree stump remover from Home Depot. And you can dose nitrate, but you have to be really careful with it. Now, I don't know if Flourish is a nitrate dose. I, I, don't, I haven't heard of that one, but it's because I don't use this stuff, so I don't learn about it necessarily. I try, but there's a lot of stuff out there, and I don't know it all. Um, but if you are dosing nitrate, be very careful, because you could dose it and dose it and dose it, and you barely see any change, and then suddenly one day, boom, it shoots up. And I've read stories from some hobbyists that, you know, they were dosing and it was doing well and then suddenly it shot up and the corals reacted badly because it was such a sudden change in nitrate. And then, you know, they stopped dosing and they wanted to collapse again. So you've got to be really careful and really stay on top of it uh, if you're going to dose nitrate to bring it up. But it is good that you're trying to bring it up a little bit because you do not want zero nitrate. M3THODX <laughs> says the recorded video during the stream was way better and enjoyable than usually on the live stream in the background. I agree. I, I think this is going to be much better. Let's see. Uh, MJ Simple Reefer asks a great question. Planning a new tank, 180 gallons or larger. Any thoughts on glass versus acrylic? Glass has different types of glass. So you've got regular glass that has that green tint to it, and then you've got Starfire glass, which is crystal clear and looks crystal clear like cast acrylic. And that's a much more expensive piece of glass, but the tank, the whole reef looks better. And when you're looking in your tank through Starflower glass, it's very, it feels very high def, very 3D, and it looks fantastic. The downside of the Starflower glass is very easy to scratch it. Now, let's switch to acrylic. Acrylic tanks are welded together, so there's no silicone holding it together. It's actually two pieces of acrylic that have been bonded into one and should, in theory, hold water forever. And if it's built well, it will last forever, and it's not nearly as heavy to bring into your home um, when you come home with your brand new tank. So a couple of people can carry it. When you have a big, heavy glass tank, you need a lot of people to carry it. But once it's in place, it doesn't matter how much it weighed, right? It's just that day was awful. <laughs> but once it's on the stand, you don't care what it weighs. The downside of acrylic is it scratches so easily. I mean, way worse than Starfire. And most people that have an acrylic tank, you know, like, oh, yeah, I love it. It's fantastic. Everything looks great. And then they're like, oh, my God, I will never get an acrylic tank again. And, uh, I mean, the thing is, you can fix an acrylic tank. You can polish out all the scratches. But normally, the way that's done is you drain the tank and you have someone polish out the scratches and you start it up again. And it looks fantastic until you scratch it again. So it's, it's a real love-hate relationship because the clarity is incredible. The strength is great. The weight is good for you know, hauling it in, hauling it out, but the, uh, the scratching is just tough. Now, if you were to run a tank with no sand, an acrylic tank, there's less likeliness of a scratch, but anything on your cleaning magnet that gets trapped, whether it's an Asterina starfish, a spirorbid worm, um, a vermitid, even those little micro brittle starfish, their exoskeleton skin is, a uh, scratchy <laughs> and you're just cleaning your glass you don't realize there's something between the two and you're like oh and you see the scratch and it's not just oh i, I can just buff it out it's not how it works it, there's more effort involved there are ways to polish out scratches in an existing reef tank but it's very meticulous takes a lot of effort and i only know one human being that does it every single year and i haven't talked to him in a while 
but uh, he has a beautiful reef tank. He got Tank of the Month twice. His name on Reef Central was Reef Keeper 2. So if you look up Tank of the Month, T-O-T-M, and then Reef Keeper 2, you'll see his fantastic tank. I visited this tank several times. Super nice guy. He's a nurse uh, by trade. And every winter, he would polish out all the scratches on his acrylic tank using the cleaning magnet and these different grades of sandpaper with all the livestock in there. And his tank would look fantastic. And I was like, man. And then he'd get a fish. So here's something no one thinks of. He bought this angel fish. It has these little like spikes, sort of like a, like the scalpel on a tank. It had these little cheek spikes. And the fish would see its reflection apparently in the acrylic and would keep hitting it with the spikes and scratched up a whole section of the tank. And he's like, are you kidding me? I just polished out everything and that stupid fish is destroying my wall. You know, it didn't do it everywhere. It just picked that one spot and it hit it over and over 50, 60, 80 times. And he was like, I can't believe it. I have to go polish that out. I just, I don't want to do it. That's something I do every winter. This is March. I don't want to do it again. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, there's a chance that even livestock and an urchin, um, they crawl all over the rock work. They climb, you know, they work their way across the substrate. They go up the glass. They go to the overflow boxes. Their bite marks can leave bite marks in the acrylic wall of your tank. So that's the downside. Acrylic is very pliable, very easy to scar. And, but it is repairable. It just, there's effort involved, which is not fun. So that's the downside. But the strength is huge. The clarity is incredible. Those right there are huge selling points. Uh, I would think acrylic tanks are always going to cost more than glass tanks. So that's another thing to keep in mind. Other than that, uh, that's, I think that's all I got for you. Uh, Falcon asked, what was the topic for today? Well, we did the whole PJAC letter, which was an important one. And then we kind of devolved into storytelling and answering lots of questions. Uh, Tim Reed says, I've been testing pH every Saturday after this chat, so probably around 5 or 6 o'clock in the evening, um, testing with API. Yeah, get away from that. <laughs> uh, look at the American Pinpoint Meter. Marine Depot sells it, might be on Amazon, BRS might have it, uh, Premium Aquatics probably has it. I, I think I bought mine from Marine Depot. Uh, I love it. It uses a 9-volt battery. Uh, you can plug it in the wall, but... The 9-volt battery lasts a long time, and you can actually leave it connected to your tank all the time and just replace the battery occasionally and leave the probe somewhere logical, and every time you look at the tank, you can see the pH. It's super handy that way, and like I said, then when you mix a batch of salt water, you can just take it right out of the tank and put it in the salt water and see if the pH is close, and if it's not, you could buffer up the salt water, and then you can, you know, do your water change. But usually, the salt water has a lower pH than the tank because the tank has better agitation, it has better surface movement and, and more flow. <laughs> Glenn says, we are living the dream if you think back of the days when reefers only had blogs. And before that, they had build threads. Uh, never imagined we'd have live video chats. Yeah, this is kind of cool. I like the way this has worked out. And it wasn't a horribly difficult thing to film. I mean, I yes, I could have just had a stationary shot of the tank for 30 minutes, but I kind of wanted to get it from different angles and show you a couple of things and, and interact with the tank a little bit in the video. I thought it'd be kind of fun, kind of keep it interesting. Let's see. Uh, Enfield says, can you do a talk or a walkthrough of the Reef Trace app so we can get the most out of it? I have repeatedly wanted to do a walkthrough of the app, you know, just kind of showcase it. But I always feel like I'm going to say something wrong, or I won't say something right, <laughs> or they'll make some kind of update and my video no longer is applicable because that no longer exists or the, the feature's been changed. And so I've been dragging my feet on that one. But uh, no, I think it's a good idea. And I think at some point I should come up with something that is useful. I've seen a couple other people like Devin from Reef Dudes and Carlos from uh, the Coral View uh, YouTube channel. Those guys do a beautiful job showing, you know, they'll be talking to the camera and the app is right next to them and everything's happening. I don't know how they do that. I am so impressed when they do that. In, in fact, half the time when I'm trying to learn, I do something, I watch their video. I'm like, oh, so that's how you did that. <laughs> 
we can't all be good at all things, you know, and those guys are really good at that. I've told them both to their face. You guys are awesome at that. I wish I could do that. Uh, Anchor says, have you ever thought about an inversion chair or the rack for your neck? No, I mean, it's been mentioned a few times. I have nowhere to put it. Um, and, you know, I don't really want to go outside and hang upside down for the neighbors to look at me. But it's not a bad idea. I just haven't. Martinez, you said get a dog. I've been wanting to get a dog for like the last year. I've even picked out some of the species that I really like. I just haven't pulled the trigger yet. And you know what the reason was? The reason I didn't get a dog is because I was traveling so much. And I knew even this year I had like eight trips planned. And I was like, I keep leaving town. And I'm gone three days at a time or longer. It's like, I just, it's unfair to the dog. Who knew everything would be canceled? I'd be staying home every single day of my life since uh february <laughs> i could have had the dog ah so anyway maybe this year a dog will happen i would love to do that again i haven't had one in a while and yeah you're right go take that dog for a nice walk let's see wow phoenix is 97 degrees today Whew. rhode island is 50 degrees it's so funny because last week we hit 94 degrees, which is weird for April. And then three days later, the high was 44 degrees. I walked out the door. I was like, what happened? And I went back in and got a, a sweater so I could head up to the post office to drop off your packages. And I was like, man, is it cold? That's a 50 degree swing in three days. That's insane. Uh, Odile says, what do you think about bristle worms? I have four in my tank. The fact that you can count them tells me they're not to worry about. That's amazing. Uh, bristle worms are fine. They are eating decayed matter. They, they are part of the cleanup crew. I mean, you don't buy bristle worms, but you just have them. And if you have too many, if you end up having thousands and thousands and your whole tank just wriggles to life like mealworms, then you can get a long nose hawkfish or you could get a arrow crab because both of those eat bristle worms and they won't eat them all, but they'll reduce the population to something because now there's a predator. And so it balances out the scales in the tank. And both the long nose hawkfish and the uh, arrow crab are interesting critters to look at anyway. So it's kind of a fun addition to your tank, but bristle worms are fine and uh, I wouldn't sweat it. Um, Jason says, is your refugium light a reef bright light? Yes, it is. <laughs> it's an XHO that is a daytime or daylight grow light. I think it's 5100 Kelvin and 6500 Kelvin because I said specifically, I want white. And that's what he sent me. And when I look at the reflection uh, of the light off the water, you can see it's two different colored diodes, uh, like, a, like piano keys, just every other one. And uh, the plants grow like crazy. It's in this video. You'll see it a couple of times. You've probably seen it already once. It's coming up again here in probably about 17 minutes. Let's see. Uh, Drama D says, does Mark sell nitrate? I don't. <laughs> I have threatened to sell you guys my tank water. <laughs> Who wants 80 nitrate? I got plenty. Uh, actually, the last time I tested it was 50, so <laughs> that's progress, right? For some reason, for a couple of weeks, my tank shot up to 80, and then it just went right back down again. And I, I have no idea what happened, why it went up. It, it's like it went up to embarrass me in front of the fish vet, and then it went back down again. It was the weirdest thing. Ansfield says, when you feed Spock the banana, do you leave the skin on it? Like, or will... My other tangs like it. Okay, so that's a two-part question. I open up the banana like you would eat the banana, and I pinch off the tip, and then I put it in the water, and I mash my fingers back and forth to break it up in the water. Or I hold the piece, and Spock will come nibble pieces off until it's small enough, and then I break it up, and it goes everywhere. The antheus will eat it. The purple tang will eat it. All the clownfish come up and get some. And then I eat the rest of the banana myself. Now, one of my friends, Mike, was joking. Um, it was almost an April Fool's Day joke, I think. I don't know if it happened on April Fool's Day or not. But he took the entire banana, peeled off the skin 
and threw it in the tank and it just floated like a big turd and we all laughed you know it was in club mills reef and uh it was a really funny post and a lot of people got a good laugh out of it but i said you don't even have fish that eat banana in that tank i mean they were all like what the heck is that giant thing up there and so then he did more things with that banana he put it in a feeding clip where it's on the glass and it's just sticking out <laughs> and of course they ignored it and then he jammed it inside his monopora capricornus and it was just sitting in there like this cucumber looking thing and of course everyone ignored it and then finally he just took it out of the tank because it wasn't gonna do there, you don't put in the whole banana <laughs> come on mike just a little bit just the tip <laughs> uh ronald says any opinions on the i dip test kits i've seen them um, I've watched them do the demonstration at Macna. It's interesting. It never made me want to buy one. But uh, I still sat through the entire 35-minute presentation. <laughs> it's an interesting device. It, it does give you the ability to um, get a digital display of your numbers if you're colorblind. So that is a benefit. Uh, I believe that device was originally designed for testing swimming pools. And they did something to where you would get all the different additives you needed to measure different parameters in our reef tanks. And... Uh, I've got one or two friends that have it, and they seem to like it. Uh, Kurt says, do you have a video that showcases your frag tank? No, because it's always looked horrible. But uh, I do have the video about how to cycle a tank on this channel, and you see the tank when it was first getting started. So there's that. But uh, when I reset it, and it looks nice, and it's doing well, you know, when, it, it, when I'm proud of it, I'll probably just do a fresh video and hopefully grow frags in it. <laughs> like a real reefer. It's so good I don't sell corals. You know, if I was trying to sell corals and I had that horrible system, I wouldn't make any money at all. <laughs> uh, everybody needs a Dave, <laughs> says. I have tons of small snails in my tank. Do I need to worry about them? I have no idea where they came from. Nope, you don't have to worry about them. Snails are fine. Snails are good. Snails are grazers. They eat algae. Some of them come out at night. Some are going to be out during the daytime. There's different types. You might have colonista snails, which are little tiny guys that are the size of BBs or smaller. Uh, there could be, well, there's a whole bunch of snails in my Critter ID section on my website. You could compare what you have to the pictures and maybe find one that matches. Uh, I like a lot of different snails. I like troca snails. Um, I like serith snails. I like the astrias. Um, and colonistas are no big deal. And that might be what you see. And sometimes your big snails will lay eggs that turn into more snails, and there's nothing wrong with free snails. Not having to buy more cleanup crew is a wonderful blessing. Uh, Charles Charles says, uh, what lights are you running? So in this video, you are watching just the XHO lighting, which are LED strips from ReefBright. And they are super tinics, and they're mounted off the tank about 16 inches off the water. There's two strips, and they, they are at an angle, so they shine into the reef in a V formation. I need to back up so you can actually see my hands. So <laughs> they come in in a V formation. And uh, then in the middle, I have metal halides that are lit up during the daytime. But when I shot this last night, it was just the XHOs, and that's what you're seeing being filmed. And all this was filmed on my iPhone 11 Pro. Like always, everything I film is on the iPhone. And Jamie says, it'd be cool to see a video of the separate tank being reset. Yes. And he says, as a background video in your live stream. Not a bad idea. Not a bad idea to actually, at all. I, I do think doing a video of the reset or even a time lapse of it just being changed and then rebuilt and then, you know, you know, put it online for you guys to see would be fun. And then, like I said, I'd like to show something nice. I just... Right now, it's just a mess. Let's see. You guys are talking to each other now. I can't find anything for me. Good thing there's a video in the background to distract you from me. <laughs> Someone wrote, 
there's an intruder in your reef tank because there's parts of me in this video. Uh, Furlock says, do you have a picture of your 400 gallon tank when you first set up the aquascape? Would love to see how much your corals have filled in. I do. I have a lot of old pictures like that. It would take me a while to find it though. But um, I do, and from time to time I show beginning, you know, like, this is what it looked like. <clears throat> and I sometimes share those, like, back then versus today pictures. I share those to my Instagram channel, which is the same as this channel, Me Loves Reef. So Instagram.com slash Me Loves Reef. And you'll see the before and after. Or, uh, and then those also propagate right into Facebook, where it shows up on the Me Loves Reef page, which is this link that you should be following on Facebook if you haven't. So it's Facebook.com slash Me Loves Reef. That is my business page. And that's where I answer questions from customers. That's where I share something fun every single day. And then, of course, we have Club Milo's Reef where we actually talk with each other on a regular basis. So you've got all of those things to follow. I don't have a, a, an actual text for the Instagram one. That's funny. But definitely follow Milo's Reef on Facebook, and that way you'll get the updates. Howard Bash says, have you ever looked at the Robo Snail? I've seen it, um, but I never got one. Uh, Glenn says, I have a question. Tell me about the orange polka dot coral. I see some frags in my LFS of a turquoise variety. I think you're talking about the coral that's right behind your words right now on my screen. And that is a type of chalice. Apparently it was one of those high-end nickname chalices when I got it. It was... An itty bitty little guy. Matter of fact, I might have just literally deleted that picture. I did. Um, I had the picture of the original frag from six years ago uh, on my desktop. And it was, you know, smaller than a quarter with four eyes. No, I'm sorry. Four mouths. Because that's what those are. Those are mouths. And uh, it grew into this giant thing. And it was very interesting looking because it had like a white or a light blue. And then it of course had the green and the orange. And like I said, it was super rare, very expensive. I got this little tiny frag, and I've just been growing it quietly in the back of my reef. And uh, I mean, I haven't trimmed a piece off. I haven't tried to grow more of it. I just let it do its thing. But it's a chalice coral, and that's what you're looking for at your LFS. Chalice corals are not really hard to keep. As long as you're maintaining nice, clean water, they kind of just do their thing, and they, they grow over rocks. They're very thin. They're like thin like a potato chip. So if you had to remove from the rock, it would break really simply, very easily. Uh, Nick suggests doing a background video with the daylight and then switch back and forth between the blue and the daylight. I think that's a really good idea too. That would be a nice uh, upcoming video for you guys where you see some of it and then you see it with the blue and then you see it back. I like that idea. I'll work on that. Robert says, some of my corals are a bit pale. Any tips for getting them back to pop? It could be that the water is too uh, nutrient poor right now and they need more food. Um, you could try feeding the corals. You could try running the lights less long per day because you might be exhausting the corals. And it's, it's exhausting the zoanthellae algae that's within their tissue. And usually pale, and also there might be a lack of fish in there. And if you don't have enough fish and you're not feeding the tank enough, corals can look pale. They can also be pale for other reasons. But normally it's going to be a lack of food or they're getting hit with too much light. Those are the couple of things that I usually would gravitate toward when you're trying to solve a problem with corals that are pale. So more fish, more food, or more coral food, and a little less light probably would help a lot. Phil says, do we need to test, oh no, do we need to raise nitrate and what level does it need to be? Well, zero is bad. Um, we would like to have our nitrate be more around, somewhere under 10 ppm would be good. And you know, if it's higher, we want to bring it down. But if you're at absolute zero, you want to bring it up a little bit. Bring it up to five, six, seven, somewhere in there. It's anything under 10 ppm would be good. Let's see. <laughs> Frogger said, would you consider taking the sand out of your tank? Absolutely not. Never, never going to happen. 
Uh, Tim says, we would love to hear you talk about metal halides versus LED versus hybrid. Do you think halides actually grow corals better? If planning a new build and money was no object, what kind of lights would you use? You know, that's a good topic. Why don't we do that one next week? I like that. I'll take a screenshot so I don't forget. Okay. Uh, this right here is a chalice too. This was a friend, my friend Wes gave me a piece of that. And it's been growing quietly in the back of my reef. I keep talking about giving him a piece back to put in his tank now, and he hasn't been ready for it. And then that little orange thing to the right is a lithophylon. And it's, it's a little tiny dot of coral, but eventually it will hopefully cover the rock and be really pretty. Uh, Reefing with those says, what streaming software are you using? This is called Ecamm Live. And uh, I've been running this software now for about a year, I think. And I, I kind of, I mean, I like it. I like the features it has in it, so I don't want to go to anything else. Uh, Kevin Jones says, I suffered a rockwork collapse. Is it okay with fish only to re-epoxy? Re yes, I would say yes, you can. You can definitely epoxy. What I would suggest you do, just to avoid any kind of risk, you didn't say how big the tank was, you didn't say how much rock slipped, is it just one area, is it all of it? Uh, you know, did an earthquake do this? But do it in sections. Like, if you have one major rock that needs to be handled now, I would fix that one and I would use some putty. The putty may make your protein skimmer overflow. Um, you definitely want to run fresh carbon as soon as you're done to take out the toxins from the putty, just because. It's just the smart thing to do. It helps reduce any potential problems with your fish. So I would look at you know working on a small area at a time, maybe do one spot today and then do another spot tomorrow and do another spot the next day, and running fresh carbon on your system would be wise, and then making sure your protein skimmer is operating properly is important too. Tim Mattel says, do you still have all of your skunk clownfish? Yes, all 11 are still in there. They're kind of spread out, but then they all get together when it's feeding time. Uh, you know, someone said here that the epoxy won't stick good without a load of super glue. Um, that's not really what I do. I actually mix up the putty, I knead it up, and then I will put it on the rock where I need it, or between the two pieces of rock and press together. And I use my fingertips and I really press and I add more putty where I need it and add another piece of putty here, another one there. Basically it's that whole tripod thing, three different points of holding it, and then just don't mess with it. Leave it alone, let it harden. That should work. You shouldn't have to use glue as well as putty for uh, getting them to work. I mean, you gotta realize the putty takes time to harden and the rock needs to be really rough where the two touch. So if it's like really smooth rock, it's like it's like trying to glue eggs together. It's just too smooth. There's no there's no texture. There's no it, there needs to be roughness and friction for the the putty to get into the grooves and the and the nooks and crannies. So if you are in a situation where you're gluing smooth things together, it may be a problem. You might be forced to actually add some glue in there as well. But in my experience, I was able to use putty when I had to secure a rock. It wasn't that big a deal. I put it where I needed it. I had a little bit more. And then I would take a piece of rock that was, you know, some kind of rubble in the bottom of my tank and I would press it into the putty to kind of give it some texture so it looks more like rock and not like Mark's thumbprints all over it. So you don't see permanent fingerprints in your reef in the putty. I'm really glad that the videos worked out today. I didn't know how well this would work, if the software would cooperate, if it would overdo the, you know, overheat the, <laughs> the processor. I have no idea what the processor is doing. I just went with it and hoped it would work out. And this seemed to really work well. Oh, my best friend gave me a gift. So this arrived from Amazon as a present, and it's a type of harness that you mount on a door frame or doorknob or a walk board, and then I'll put my head in a sling and it'll put some traction. So I'm going to try this out today and maybe start using it every day until I feel better. You know? So I got that to try out. So that was a nice gift. Let's see. 
Johnny just got here. He says he's late, and he's right, because I'm about, I'm about done with the stream. We've been at it for two and a half hours. Johnny, where have you been? We were waiting for you. Uh, Claudius asked the question, how is Spock doing? And, you know, did the vet elaborate? The vet saw what she saw. I'm sorry I haven't had time to edit um, that video. It's on the, the hit list of things to do. And uh, people have been saying, where's the Tammy video? And, uh, that's on the hit list of things to do. Matter of fact, I'm building a song for Tammy now. So, I mean, there you go. Um, but she saw what was going on. She didn't want to do anything. She wanted to come back in six months and, and reassess. So that's all we got. And Spock is, you know, still swimming around eating. I just feel like she can't see out of one side of her head. Uh, Tim suggested a couple things I could take. Uh, I've actually heard of glucosamine and the other one. I think I even have bottles of it. Because <laughs> I've been dealing with neck problems for a long time. I haven't taken it in a while, though. Might not hurt to start taking it again. Um, Mr. Easy says, do you or anyone add minerals to their RO water? No, we don't add anything. The RODI water is already purified. It's ready to go. We don't want minerals. Saltwater tanks don't do that. We use the salt mix. It adds whatever we, you know, is needed, whatever is in the magic recipe of salt. And uh, we make our salt water, and then we put that in our tank. And for just top off, which is replacing what evaporated, we just put in pure RODI water with nothing else. Uh, Anfield said, what is a sudden bloom of bubbles sent into your tank every now and again? So what happens is when I turn off and see right now uh, the return pump is off. You can tell it's off because you can see a little bit of light um, between the black trim and the water. And my return pump was off. All the, the only movement happening in the tank now is from the vortex. When I shot this video, you're looking at this second. And then after a total of 10 minutes, my return pump automatically turns on. And when it turns on, it pushes water up the plumbing, which of course pushes air out of the plumbing and shoots the air bubbles into the tank. And so you got to see that twice in this video because the two different times I shot, I uh, wanted to include showing what it looks like when the return pump comes back on. But I only turn off the return pump once a day, always at night at 10.30. That's when I feed my fish. And the return pump is off for 10 minutes so the food stays in the reef and all the fish can catch it and whatever they don't eat or whatever blows around, corals can try to capture. And after 10 minutes, the return pump starts on again and stays on again for the next day. Uh, Nick says, what would be your best tip for getting bubble tip anemones to thrive? And look at the teeth on that clownfish you have. That's awesome. Um, the best tip would be to make sure that any pumps in that tank with the anemone is covered with some kind of a screen or a grate so it can't get sucked in and chewed up and destroyed. That is a number one rule with anemones and reef tanks. And so many people post, oh no, I woke up, my anemone is in the pump, or, or all my fish are dead because the anemone was chopped up, or, you know, there's pieces of anemone everywhere. So that was my number one tip. So <laughs> if you want to thrive, you don't want to die. And, you know, we don't want to get stuck inside a power head or get sucked into a power head because it just tears it to shreds. Other than that, normal reef parameters, um, the occasional feeding maybe. I don't feed mine. I feed the fish, and the fish poop into the anemones apparently because I have tons of them, and uh, I, I literally do not put food on them. They inhale what they can grab when I, when I pour the food in at night. Um, Tim says, do you know the name of the two big chalices in the front? Also, is the Shadow Caster a blue Oregon tort? The Shadow Caster is definitely not a blue tort. I have a blue tort. I've got an Oregon tort and I've got a Cali tort. And they are on the other end of the tank. And the Shadow Caster, I have no idea. I gave it that name because no one knows where it came from. And it was creating a giant shadow and everything underneath it was dying because it had no light. And so I said, you know, I'm going to call that the Mila Shadow Caster. And it just... 
I had some friends say, yes, do that. And so I did. Um, it's some kind of a Acropora that's in the staghorn family. I don't, I don't even know what to compare it to. Oh, that's the end of our video. All right, so that was our third run. We are going to wrap this up. Uh, let me see if I have any last questions. And then you asked about the name of the chalices. I don't know the names of my chalices. I, I never do. And occasionally someone say, oh, that's such and such. That's like clown crazy. I'm like, okay. And I don't write it down, so I don't remember. <laughs> I forget. Uh, Alexis says, hello from Cyprus. What are the plans for the main tank? Any kind of renovations? The only plan I've got in mind right now at this point is going to be to uh, get some woodwork around this tank. And primarily because my son brings over my grandson and he likes to get into everything. And I think it's time to bulletproof that tank a little bit to keep it safe. So that's on my, my plan. Boy, this camera is like, doesn't even want to focus. Other than that... Uh, Furlux says, what are your thoughts on Wave or Vortec pumps when working with the Apex? Do you recommend one over the other? Do you need an extra piece of kit to run the Vortec with the Apex? Yeah, you will. You'll need to run the, uh, the WMX module to talk to Vortec pumps. Any kind of Ecotech gear needs the WMX module. Um, the Wave pumps are designed for the Apex, and I've got, I always, you know, people are using them all the time and seem very happy with it. So I would probably recommend you just get yourself some waves since you have the Apex and you can just set it up any way you want, put them where you like, create some really cool flow patterns and have a nice setup without a lot of trouble. And there's a super chat. Thank you very much. Stavidur. <laughs> I feel like you need a vowel or two in there. <laughs> I might use your money to buy a vowel. Tim says, have you ever uh, thought about going down to the areas in the Caribbean where people search for shipwrecks for Spanish gold? No, um, I do like to dive. I don't like to explore. I like to find a spot and stay there and look for life. Um, it would be cool to find a gold doubloon or something. That would be kind of a neat thing. But no, I've never actually thought of going out uh, wreck diving, hoping to find treasure like we see in some movies. That would be neat. But uh, no. <laughs> And then Mr. Reefbuster says, what's the max amount of fish you'd recommend for a 25-gallon nano with a 10-gallon sump and a protein skimmer? Oh, I don't know. You're going to want small, tiny fish. And if you get itty-bitty little guys, you can have more than if you have medium-sized fish. Um, a 25-gallon, I don't know, you could have six fish in there maybe? Like clown-sized fish? <laughs> I don't know. You have, to, you, you have to be kind of picky on that one. That, that's not a lot of uh, water volume. So, you know, like, let's say you had a pair of clowns and a six-line wrasse and a royal grama um, and a long-nosed hawkfish. You were kind of maxing out that tank already. So that's kind of what I would suggest. Something, or get little tiny fish. Like neon gobies, you get tons of those. They'd be awesome. They'd be everywhere. But they get sucked into pumps. <laughs> so that's not great. Uh, West Philly says, are you using a controller? If so, how? Um, I have an Apex controller. I've had the, uh, before that was the Aqua controller. It's the same company. And I've been running their gear on my tanks since 2004. I've got a whole bunch of different power strips connected to the brain. I use an app on my phone called Fusion. It lets me turn things on and off manually if needed, but most of it's all completely automated and just knows when to do things, knows what to do if there's a problem, knows to let me know if there's a problem via texts and notifications. So it's a really convenient uh, uh, device that uh, I can't imagine running a tank without one. Uh, Dan says, "Could I'm in the UK, could you make a screen for my open top tank? No, I can't. Um, I don't make those screen tops but there are companies that do. And then DD Aqua Solutions, they make a really cool frame. They're over there in your general part of the world, and you can cut and assemble that kit 
and install the screen and put it right on top of your tank. And it'll, it's a DIY project you can do in an afternoon and uh, it would cost you a lot less than trying to have anyone make something in America and ship it to you. Uh, I guess we're still talking about my neck pain. <laughs> it's an ongoing topic. Glenn says the best way to deal with it is take hot showers, get massage therapy, and do exercises to build the muscles around the vertebrae. You're right on all of that, and I take super long hot showers, and I actually turn the knob down really, really low so that I can have hot water longer, <laughs> just to make myself feel better. Um, so I feel like I'm not wasting as much water because it's coming out slow. Uh, Frogger says, how's the new sump doing? Are you enjoying it? I love my sump. I, it's awesome. It was in that video we looped through a couple times. Thanks, Dave. I appreciate that. He said we have the best Facebook group. And Glenn gave us a, a super chat. Thank you very much. It's a really nice, fresh live stream or video in the background. Your show is a great highlight for the week. You know, I, I look forward to our streams every Saturday myself a lot more than you guys probably do. <laughs> I really enjoy my, my chance to talk with you guys and uh, invite you into the group and, you know, tell you about products I'm selling or things I've made out of acrylic that, you know, made my life easier and maybe it'll make your life easier too. I mean, that I feel like you're, you're my family, and I know it sounds super cliche, but, you know, I recognize a lot of your names every week after week after week, and, uh, you know, I really... And the thing is, you're... YouTube name may not be the same as your Facebook name, so I don't always connect you guys properly, but I try. And then, of course, sometimes I get to meet you in person at the different shows, and then you'll tell me, I am such and such on YouTube, or I am such and such on Instagram, or my name is this on Facebook. And I love finding out who's who. So, you know, yeah, this has been great. I don't even know what number we are live stream wise but uh, we've uh, been doing this now for several years, and I, it's very much my thing. And my, when my son says, are you going to visit? I said, well, I've got a live stream at 2 on Saturday. <laughs> and he's like, ah. But then sometimes my son will show up on the live stream because he wants to see how I'm doing. So that's kind of fun, too. But guys, uh, I'm going to wrap this up. We're near the end of the chat anyway. It looks like I can scroll down and not feel guilty about ignoring anything. And uh, I hope you guys have a great week. Please stay safe. Please don't catch the virus. Please don't give the virus to someone else. <laughs> you know, if you're carrying it. You know, oh man, such a world, so scary. Test your water, see what's going on with your tank, make sure everything's working correctly. Um, if you haven't, start working on backups for emergency situations. You know, get that extra backup return pump or make sure you have an extra light in case a light burns up or make sure your top off system is working correctly. You know, is there anything that you need to get now so that you have it at the ready if something were to go wrong? Other than that, I will see you guys next Saturday. We already have a topic picked out, and I saved it so I wouldn't forget. And uh, thanks again for all the super chats, and I hope that you guys have a great week.